Gary and Company. I'm going to be keeping you company for the next few hours. You are not going to believe the company. This company. You're going to bankrupt your mama's company. At least I have the radio to keep me company. On 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. You know, moral victories are not supposed to exist in sports, right? At least at a certain level. I mean, I get like an elementary school. That's one thing. But but once you get to a particular point, certainly professionally, it's like, no, nah, moral victories don't, don't exist. People are getting paid millions of dollars. And for that matter, at the collegiate level, now I think you could also say, if you'd like, that there is a different expectation for – athletes because of the fact that they are now basically paid handsomely they're paid healthy right but even still every once in a while stories come along where you kind of put that aside and you go you know what typically we don't like bring that up but we're going to make an exception here for example Last night, the Pacers going into Boston, getting down 20. In the NBA, guys are making millions of dollars. You want to win every game. But you're going against one of the best teams in the East. You're a team that is still kind of piecing itself together. Your star player is coming back off injury. And so to be down 20, come back, fight your way in, and get to the point where you are within striking distance in the fourth quarter kind of feels like a moral victory. But it's a loss. I get it for the Pacers. But a lot to be optimistic about with that game last night. And it was fun to see them on national television competing and having people say, like, hey, man, you know what? This team's fun. This team's good. On the collegiate side of things, Anthony Leal is a guy that was a Mr. Basketball, that was a four-star recruit, that his high school feats or accomplishments probably were a little bit offset or or erased by the fact that it was during the COVID year when everything kind of got shut down. It was weird. And he comes to Indiana and has essentially been an end of bench guy. His most significant moment as an Indiana basketball player had been the fact that he put out a viral video at Christmas letting his sister know that he was paying her student loans with his NIL money. And right there, because of that, you say to yourself, okay, so He is not immune to being criticized because he is now basically a professional athlete. I know it's harsh, but it's reality. But you still, even with that, put an exception to it and say, even though he is getting compensated for being on that roster, I've got to tip my cap and say it's a great story and beyond a moral victory, but a victory itself when he leads his team or is a big part of it last night in a win for Indiana in a game that they certainly couldn't afford to lose. No question about that. And it was a great story, and we'll talk about that over the course of the show today. Good afternoon to you on a – today is Eddie a hump day Wednesday, correct? That would be correct. Did you get a haircut? No, I did not. Your hair looks very beaver cleaver today. Thank you. I did shave. I don't look (laughs) as homeless. You you shaved what, like below the the beard line? Yeah, my neck beard, yeah. Okay. You need to go all the way up to the chin, right? Like you got – the neck is still – you still got a little Andrew Luck going on there. I know, but it's uh, it's all even all the way around, though. Okay, fair it's enough. It's not uneven anymore. Uh, that is the voice of Eddie Garrison. He is the CEO of the company here at Query & Company. He runs the board for us and mans things and gets everything set up. My name is Jake Query. Jimmy Cook, the president of the company here as well. And, Jimmy, as I talked about last night, I would assume you watched Indiana-Iowa, amongst other things, when you were not watching YouTube clips of Taylor Swift cheering on the Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, it was hard to balance the evening, I'll be honest, because there's so many Taylor Swift Chiefs clips that it's... Yes, Jake, I did watch all of Indiana and Iowa, caught all of Pacers and Celtics as well, and it looked like from the Hoosiers' side of things, we'll start there, a completely different Indiana team, especially offensively in that first half, than I've seen all year. I mean, a lot of that is a tribute to Anthony Lill, a lot of it is... Mackenzie and Baco makes a couple threes early. It looks like that, you know, maybe they're going to start finding things offensively. Winds up being a very close game late and give credit to Indiana. They wind up winning this ball game. I don't know if this is a turning point moment for them, but we were discussing yesterday. They're running out of games to circle on the schedule. That could be turning point moments. And if you're going to look back, if they are going to rewrite the ship, which again, 
I want Indiana to do this. I want them to make a run in the tournament. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I'm going to stand by what I said. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But I don't think they're going to make the tournament. But that said, if you're playing out a world where it could happen, at some point, you have to have a jumping off point. And maybe that was it last night. I thought, Jimmy, a couple of things about Indiana here, okay? Number one, I had said, I don't know, like a week ago or so, certainly didn't say this was definitively going to happen, but I'll, I'll, I will stand here and say what what we had discussed, not even we had discussed, I was the only one that really had mentioned it. What I had mentioned to Mike DeCourcy, for example, uh, did not turn to be accurate, so I apologize to people for that, but it is accurate that there were people close to the Indiana program that told me that they were curious if not if Kalel Ware would make the decision to simply sit out the rest of the year to make sure that he does not injure himself leading into the NBA draft. Now, part of that may be that he knows that Mike Woodson has great pull when it comes to the NBA draft. So, you know, he, he returned last night and he played really well. I mean, he, listen, I know that he – the the foot – and the ankle injury, you know, is not an easy one to come back from, but I thought he was obviously great for them. I mean, he had a, a huge day yesterday, uh, a huge night, I should say. So uh, kudos to him for that and to get back on the floor. Malik Renew obviously getting hurt is something we're going to have to keep an eye on. Same with Xavier Johnson. But when it came down to it, they they did what they needed to do, right? They absolutely did what they needed to do. By the way, Eddie Garrison, do you happen to have, out of curiosity – the breaking news sounder. Uh, this just in, and we might actually, since I had said that we were going to try to do this in the second half of the show, with the way things were in flux, we may replay this actually later in the show for those that are tuning in to expecting to hear it then. Uh, Indiana All-Star, and by that I mean starting point guard for the NBA All-Star game, Tyrese Halliburton, who played last night in Boston. And, you know, I had a lot of questions about coming off of that injury the next day, how it feels, right? I mean, sometimes you go off the adrenaline of the game, and obviously he he felt good last night playing. There was a minute limitation, but they got him within, you know, you have to get to the 65 games for uh, all league performances and things like that. Tyrese Halliburton in New York now, correct, Eddie? The team is in New York? Correct. He will be joining the program in about 18 minutes. Tyrese Halliburton will be on the show here coming up bottom of the hour. We will talk to Tyrese Halliburton, including, by the way, one area where he and one Jimmy Cook are going to have to arm wrestle. Oh, 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 I'm losing that game, but sure, why? <laughs> I will let you know when we have I'm, I'm anxious now. Now you got there me on edge. A, there is a specific. Oh, I know why. There's a specific I won't spoil beef it, but I know why. that you might have with Tyrese Halliburton. Yeah. Yeah. Specific beef you might have with him. Yep. Um, but back to Indiana. And again, Halliburton coming up about 20 minutes from right now. Back to Indiana last night, Jimmy. If you went piece by piece, and I know that Leal was the big story, but I will, like I said, in the terms of Khalil Ware, I thought he was really good last night, especially once Renew went down and, you know, he was the guy that, that, Kind of basically said, I'll, I'll carry you for the first 70% of the game. Well, it matched up with what you said yesterday, Jake, specifically about Khalil Ware. And we've acknowledged this. When people go up against Zach Eady, and yes, I was with you, the effort plays, seeing Zach Eady be the first one of the deck when you'd rather be Khalil Ware is frustrating and maddening and is a, an example of what could be perceived as a team that has been killed off, that is no longer has that fighting spirit. But you and I also, and you brought this up yesterday, it's different for a player of Khalil Ware's caliber when you're not up against a behemoth like Zach Eady. He is still right. a very good player in his own right, and it felt like exactly how you mapped it out. It felt like for Khalil Ware, a highly efficient 80% from the field, 23 points for him to go along with 10 boards, so he has another double-double to his name. Every piece of this Hoosiers team, if they're going to turn things around, and a lot of it starts with outside shooting – but it also is reliant on him being a factor on a nightly basis, whether it is creating second-chance opportunities on the glass, whether it's ending a defensive possession with a rebound or a block shot, or whether it's his scoring capability. There are so many avenues to point to for why Indiana is able to outlast Iowa last night at Assembly Hall, but yes, Kalu Ware is at the top of that list, as he will likely be moving forward, especially with an... I didn't see this last night, so if it's come out since then, please forgive me. 
especially depending on what happens with those rotation with the Xavier Johnson absence, right? Like that's that that's a big deal for Indiana in terms of what you're going to have to structure and what you're going to ask about from your guards, especially when playing alongside Khalil Ware. Now, Indiana has the day – when I say Indiana, I mean the Hoosiers, IU. Uh, they have the day off today, if I'm not mistaken. So probably won't get a full report or diagnosis on some of the injuries coming off of that Iowa game, um, at least until tomorrow. And that's when – you, you know, we'll get a better idea with that. Also, I didn't mean to undercut Malik Renu as well. He was injured last night, too. So, again, you're just you're hoping that you get at least some positive news when injury news comes out. Um, other news, by the way, in the world of sports, before we get to Tyrese Halliburton coming up in about oh, just over 15 minutes from now, uh, this just coming out in the last hour or so, a little more esoteric, I realize. But, Jimmy, you are or are not a fan of or a casual observer. I know that some people are based on – just, you know, the Netflix series and everything else in the last handful of years. Formula One. Very casual, but I did see the story that you were talking about today. And in fact, whether it was off air or on air, I wanted to ask you about its significance. Because I'll be honest, when it comes to F1, like I'm very, very casual, but it's hard to miss it in today's sports world when we're consuming so much. But I did see the story you're talking about. So Michael Andretti and Andretti Autosport, Formula One has essentially said, uh, thank you for your inquiry, but it will be minimum 2028 before we would allow you into the Formula One grid. Essentially, what that means is the following. Formula One obviously has, I believe right now it is 11 teams, 10 or 11 teams. My apologies for having to think off the top of my head there. But Michael Andretti and Andretti Autosport, which is now known as Andretti Global. Michael Andretti, who is the son of Mario Andretti, the father of Marco Andretti, the man who has started more Indianapolis 500s without an Indy 500 win than anybody in history and one of the probably top 10 open-wheel drivers of the last 50 years, certainly in the United States, um, and and actively involved in a number of different open-wheel racing series in North America. He has teams within the entire ladder series of the IndyCar series, by that I mean the support series, and then he obviously has an IndyCar team as well. And... He has been actively involved for the last couple of years of trying to get a team assembled to be, for lack of a better phrase, an expansion franchise in Formula One and become a regular uh, team in the Formula One series. They have also partnered with, in the last year, Andretti Global, as it's now known, had gotten a commitment from Cadillac as an engine manufacturer for them to be in the Formula One grid. But for whatever reason, and there are a lot of reasons that one can perhaps speculate, although I don't know that anybody knows definitively this answer, but for whatever reason, the Formula One owners and officials have routinely essentially denied or blocked Andretti Global and Michael Andretti from joining in Formula One. Andretti himself was a Formula One driver in the early 90s. Um but that appears to be shelved for at least four more years. Particularly interesting or somewhat surprising, I guess, when you consider that his father, Mario, has been an active lobbyist for Michael's team, clearly, and is, in my opinion, at least from the United States standpoint, the greatest ambassador for open wheel racing in the world. I mean, I think you could... I personally believe that Michael Andretti, or excuse me, that Mario Andretti is the most famous race car driver in the world, I, even to this day. I know that, you know, obviously Michael Schumacher and, you know, current Formula One drivers and, you know, Ayrton Senna, there are a lot. But Mario Andretti, I think the thing that Mario Andretti that sets him apart is that Mario Andretti is a household name in the United States and some of those Formula One people are not. And then you combine that he is a household name worldwide along with the others in Formula One. But that news today that Michael Andretti, who I'm going to try to get on the show and find out his version of things, um, not going to be in Formula One. So last night, Jimmy, you did or did not watch? You kind of flip back and forth between games? Yeah, I was going dual screen. You know, I love to break out the dual screen, get the main screen on one. And then last night it was an iPad. But yes, I was able to watch most of the Pacers Celtics, including all the second half. How about... And maybe we should let Tyrese Halliburton know this. Are we good luck? 
Are we good luck when you come on the show for your next game based on yet last night? I, I mean, not from a winning standpoint. We should exclusively say game day because we also had Miles Turner on, and Miles didn't play great last night, but Neesmith was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Neesmith, the mojo of coming on. You know, Neesmith said he was going to take a nap, right? So he, he comes on here. He talks about unbroken. He talks about wearing cowboy boots, and then he goes out and – um. Shows why, and I think, you know, we'll ask Halliburton about him, but Halliburton was really saying his praises. I thought Neesmith last night was outstanding. And down the stretch, you know, the – I thought maybe, and this is probably nitpicking, and I get why they do this in rotation. The Pacers have talked about the fact that they're the best third-quarter team in the league. And or in their mind, you know what I mean? Hey, we're a third quarter team. I'm not saying statistically they are. I don't, I don't know those numbers. But if you were to talk to the team, they would say, look, we're a third quarter. Like, we love the third quarter. And because of just the way rotations work. And last night, you know, they got down big. They knew. You ever have one of those games, Jimmy, where the other team's just hitting everything? And yes. you're like, what? Could, and, and at some point you just say, there's nothing we can do about this, right? The only thing that made me, because I had that feeling about two, maybe three times last night, was I had to remind myself, especially in the first half, it's the NBA. Like, even though the Pacers are shorthanded, there's going to be another run. Like, either they're going to get blown out again in Boston, or there's going to be another run to have a couple bites at the apple. And, and there were. And give credit to the Pacers. And I imagine I'm fascinated to ask Tyrese this because – I get it. Like, it's it's not his fault. It's not the Pacers' fault. I don't blame anybody. But I imagine it's maddeningly frustrating to be on a minutes restriction in a game like that because the conversation today, as you mentioned, Jake, it's hard to have moral victories. But it's, man, if, if they had Tyrese at full health, how does that game end? Right. Well, agreed. And here here's the thing that, like I said, is probably nitpicking because in the end they were still in position. Correct. But you could make the argument that or or that you could raise the question of did they wait too long to go all hands on deck down the stretch? Like Siakam was out, you, you know, there's seven, eight minutes to go in the game and you're down like double digits. Eventually they get everybody out there and they were able to get within, I think, three. It was mostly five. And then it went, it kind of ballooned back to 10. And then in the last minute, you know, you get down to it where there were just a couple of, like, the way the ball bounces out of bounds and, and you know, the shot clock runs out on you because you get two shots blocked within a four-second span. I, I get that. But should they have gone full rich, to use a racing term, with the with the fuel that gets you to the finish with the most speed. Should they have gone to that earlier, I guess? Now, Jimmy, here's a question. Is that me nitpicking, or is that a fair concern? I think it's a fair takeaway and a fair question, but based on the fact that even though they, whether they waited too long or not, as you mentioned at the start, they had chances. Like, they they, they have a chance to tie the game when Neesmith's shot, what in the corner or wherever it was, gets blocked by Derek White. They have a chance to make that a one-point game when Miles Turner has no choice but to get a quick shot up and he's in a double team basically with Tatum and Porzingis and his shot gets blocked. Like, I think it's a fair question, but my takeaway was more, do they win this game by a couple possessions if Tyrese is not on him? And again, I want to clarify this on the front end. This is not me saying he should not have been on a minutes restriction. That's not what I'm saying. I imagine, though, it was very frustrating for both him and the Pacers knowing that was the tough choice they had to make because it is such a long season. Like, and you can't afford, both for him financially and the Pacers long term, you can't afford to break your rules because you want to get a win in Boston and run the risk of him getting hurt and missing more games. You know, one of the things about Boston is that game was going on. Sometimes, it, and this is a, a really weird, and, and the thing, same thing that kind of happened to Phoenix not saying this actually happens to the players but as a as a spectator there are times where there are so many riches for them that it's almost like they're not certain where the ball swings around to and whose turn it is in that yeah. possession you know what i mean i mean between 
how many guys in that game last night for Boston hit a shot and you're like, oh my gosh, I completely forgot they're there also. I mean, they are loaded, right? They're loaded. I mean, Holiday comes in and is hitting shots and you're like, uh, you know, what do you do, right? It's the Derek White triples for me. Every time Derek White hits yeah. a big time shot, I'm just like, Derek White's a good player, though. He is. They, they he's, gave a, up a, he is he's, he's a good player, but it's just... An understated the, good player, right? But, but he would be, yes, understated good player. Because when you list off the names, off the top of my head, not based on just what they've done this year, just in terms of name recognition, star power, star pull. You mentioned the Suns. Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker. Bradley Beal's kind of like Derek White. Correct. Well, you know what I mean? But but I would, I would almost... Bigger name. Yes. Bigger name, but like... But then you forget how good he is, but right? But then Eddie tells me that Grayson Allen is leading the league in three point percentage. I'm like, there's no way. And then I go and look at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my goodness, he is. This is crazy. And with last night, to your point about star power, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Chris Tasporzingis, Drew Holiday. Oh, and Derek White's there too. Like, yeah, it's just it's those are the top of their conferences. Maybe not by record right now, but in terms of big name teams currently in the league. And Boston's always been a perennial power, of course. But you throw Phoenix in there because of the big three they have. And then you realize, oh, they have some good role players, too. Or they have some good weapons in their starting five that aren't just big names. If you right now, if you were starting an NBA team right now, and Webham Yama is not a possibility for you, nor is the guy that's going to join us in eight minutes, it would be hard to pass on Jason Tatum. Yeah. It would it would be twenty five years old, six eight. Can I mean he can do a gabillion things. There's three names that all do different things that would be on that list for me. Jason Tatum, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Nikola Jokic. Yeah. No I mean, Luca. I really like Luca, but he'd probably be fourth still for oh, me. Out of Anthony list. Edwards. Anthony and, Edwards and is, is a really good and player. Is a dude. I, I, uh. But I just think Jason Tatum, his ability to, you know, he can shoot. I, I just think he is so, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, Jokic is a, is unbelievable. And they're finished products. But if you're they start, are established what they are. If you're starting with Jokic, you know, then you got to go out and you got to get yourself yeah. the Booker and the, or excuse me, the, um, the, the Jamal Murray, you know, the guys that feed off of him, yeah. right? Which I guess you could, because he probably does make guys better. But I just think Tatum is one that if you, if the ball is in his hands, I guess a better way of saying it, not build around, but if there's eight seconds left in a game and you got to pick somebody, Tatum is as good as any, yeah, right? He's I mean, deservedly he, he, in that conversation. He definitely puts the fear into yeah. you. No question about that. Uh, busy show lined up for you. Again, Tyrese Halliburton going to join us in just a couple of minutes. We will probably talk. Did we have to reschedule uh, Zach, Eddie? What are we doing there? Two o'clock. Two o'clock for Zach. Now it's Osterman, right? Correct. Okay, Zach Osterman at two o'clock. And Rick Fusen who has long been the chief operating officer and president for the Indiana Pacers. His retirement was announced last week. He came to the Pacers in 1984 as the director of special events, and now with the most special of events, the NBA All-Star Game coming to Indianapolis. That is the perfect swan song, I guess, Rick Fusen figured. His retirement announced last week, and so I thought, you know what? be a lot of fun to have Rick on and just talk about his excitement for the All-Star game, but also the pride that he has in the things that the Pacers as a franchise have accomplished over the last, hard to believe, 40 years with Rick Fusen involved with the Indiana Pacers. So that conversation coming up 1 o'clock as well. When we come back, he is one of four men in the Pacers franchise history to represent the franchise as a starter in the All-Star game. He will be doing that right here in Indianapolis, talking about Tyrese Halliburton, and he is our guest on the other side. The IRS is the most powerful...
93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. My name is Jake Query. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Jimmy Cook, the other voice you hear on this program. Joining us now on the show, a man who is set to join Reggie Miller, Jermaine O'Neal, and Paul George as just the fourth Indiana Pacer to start an All-Star game, and he will be doing it right here in the city of Indianapolis at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. But before then, on the road in New York, it is Pacers and Knicks next. Last night against the Boston Celtics, Tyrese Halliburton, joining us on the show. Tyrese, thanks so much for the time. How are you? I'm good, my man. How are you? Uh, we cannot complain, man. There's a lot to be excited about. And I you know, I, I let off by saying there's no such thing as moral victories in professional sports, but I thought last night there were certainly a lot of things to like. We'll get to that. But I want to begin with the burning question, which is this, and I hope it's only the question that's burning. Um, you know, last night, obviously, you were on a minute limitation because of the hamstring that you're still coming back from. Sometimes I think when you go through something where there's a lot of adrenaline, Tyrese, it takes kind of a day to get a real feel for where things are. So how do you physically feel today after playing last night? Uh, I feel good this morning. I feel good this morning. I think that was the plan, uh, hence why there's a minute restriction put in place, is that you know you hope that you, you know, ice, get your treatment, whatever, wake up in the morning and feel good and be ready to go. So uh, I feel good this morning um, waking up and moving around and be ready to go against the Knicks uh, tomorrow. And, you know, my goal is to play in the back-to-back with the Kings the next game. And um, I think that if I can show that I can get through three games in four days, that that's encouraging to our medical staff and, um, you know, will help the minutes restriction move along. So you were obviously, I would assume, aware of the minute restriction going into it. I mean, take me through just that process and kind of who leads that conversation. Yeah, there's definitely a constant conversation between everybody involved and making decisions. Um, you know, for me, it's my it's the front office, their coaching staff, their medical staff, it's my agents, it's everybody uh, coming together and having you know kind of a group conversation as to what's best for me as a player and uh, you know what's going to keep me on the floor the most. Uh, you know, because that's where I want to be at the end of the day. So it's just constant conversation, and um, you know, I think after the Portland game, my body not reacting the way I wanted to. After the game, I think we obviously had to kind of take a step back and, and understand, figure out what we have to do uh, for me to be good, you know, after um, after games and to be able to, you know, play in multiple games moving forward and just be healthy. So obviously you are – I mean, I know it's got to be frustrating at times, right, when the game's on the line and you're sitting there. But, um, you know, take me through that, that dichotomy of emotion because I'm – you clearly I'm assuming that you – you know, you're aware of it, you understand – why you're sitting there but man isn't there part of you that's like you know Reggie Miller said on the broadcast look if, if it's me I'm going in there and I'm saying just give me three more minutes how tempting was it well it was you know I, everybody knows that I'm a competitor like I want to be on the floor um you know but I think that this being my first game back we had a really upfront conversation because the, the medical staff knows who I am and what I stand for and how much I'm playing so it was the coaching staff and so it was just a conversation of it literally didn't matter how I performed yesterday. These were my minutes, and there was nothing I could do to stop that. <laughs> so uh, I just got to the point where there was no need for me to, you know, go to the medical staff and have an argument uh, because I was already, I mean, already angry that I, you know, had only played so many minutes anyway. So I'm just trying to do what's right and, and know my big picture and know our team's big picture at the end of the day. I mean, I trust my teammates. Uh, we were still right there to win the game at the end of the day. Um, you know, they made a, a hell of a defensive play there to, you know, kind of clinch the game there. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. I'm a competitor at the end of the day. I want to be on the floor. But at the same time, I got to, you know, know the big picture of this and understand I need to be healthy for us to, you know, accomplish everything we want to as a team. Pacers star Tyrese Halliburton is our guest. Tyrese, you're not alone in this, but you, among other players, have expressed your frustration with the 65-game threshold that the NBA has on players that began this season for – other awards, all NBA, MVP, those kind of things that in your case directly impact the value of your contract over its life. How mentally taxing is that on you knowing that it's out of your control with these injuries? This hasn't been a load management thing. You're just trying to go through the rigors of an NBA schedule and now it's being asked of you of, oh, you can't miss three or four more games. Otherwise you're going to get penalized for it. How has that been from the mental side of things through this process? Um, I, I mean, being honest, like obviously it's obviously it's frustrating. Um, I've made my comments known on on how I feel about it. Um, understanding that this plan, I mean, I, I also understand that this was put in plan 
put in place so that, you know, guys wouldn't load manage as much, you know, keep guys on the floor. And I fully understand, and I'm a supporter of that. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm 23 years old. If I could play 82 games, uh, if I could play 48 minutes a game, 82 games a year, I would. Like, I love basketball. I love competing. I want to play as much as I can. Um, but, you know, I can't control being injured and kind of the freak accident that, you know, happened to me this year. Uh, so I really have no control over that. Um you know, so I, I think that it's due to, you know, what our what our league has been in the past and our owners and uh, the league being frustrated by that. And that's completely understandable. Um, but I don't think that this plan was put into play to affect guys that are injured. Um, you see the MVP of our league get hurt last night. And honestly, it's I think that it's crazy that it was very obvious that Joel re-aggravated his knee injury against us uh, in Indy. And that has never been – nobody ever spoke on it. No talking heads in the media. Nobody ever said anything about it. They watched him limp around for a whole second half. Um, and then he misses the Denver game. And now it's a talking point and a surprise that he's not playing, even though it was clear that he had got hurt the game before. Um, and then he re-aggravates it again. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, Joel Embiid played 60 games this year doing what he's doing, which is one of the greatest offensive seasons we've ever seen you're voting him MVP. It doesn't matter. So I think that uh, that's the tough part about it. And there's no right or wrong answer. Like that's a problem, you know, but um, at the end of the day, I want to be on the floor. So, I mean, the fact that I have to play to, to make all NBA is not a problem for me. I just, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm doing everything I can, to, you know, keep my body right and be able to play. Um, but yeah, it's definitely frustrating. I think it'd be frustrating for anybody that was put in this position. Um, but, I mean, listen, I'm not going to go. I mean, it's hard for me to, like, you know, go in the media and complain where I come from. The amount of money that I make currently and the amount of money I make moving forward is life-changing money. And, you know, money that I, I would have killed for as a, as a kid and, you know, my parents killed for for me growing up. So I understand that in the context of it, of course. Um, but that's that money that I could be missing out on, you know, if I don't play those games, um, is also life-changing money um, on a bigger scale. So, um, yeah, I think there's no right or wrong answer. You just kind of got to go about it the way you can. Tyrese, if there's a media outlet where you just want to, you know, occasionally be able to voice yourself, you're more than welcome any time, right? I mean, we're all for it, right? We don't want to yeah, get anybody in trouble, yeah. but let's go, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, um, let me ask you this. If I'm looking at this optimistically, and when you have a player of your your, your rising star that then gets hurt, and fortunately it wasn't, you know, a debilitating injury, but a nagging one, let's say, um, if there's a silver lining I would look at, I would say maybe this gave Tyrese Halliburton an opportunity to see the game with Pascal Siakam now in there and different players to see it while sitting and watching and learning his teammates in, from a different vantage point. Is there any truth to that possibility? And is there anything that you saw from somebody where you're like, you know, I don't know that I've seen that on the floor. I need to keep that in mind when I'm back out there and meshed in with them think anybody on our team I think that going into the season and just as time goes on like if you're my teammate I have a very very good understanding of who you are as a player what you bring to the table how I can uh, help you know put players and put team, my teammates in the best position how they can help me uh, so I think like I have a good understanding of that I think while I've been out the biggest thing that I've been paying attention to is just Pascal being around him how he operates on a daily basis um, I think he's a very underrated I mean, not underrated, but I'm trying to think the right way to say this. Like, from afar, you can't tell how good of a communicator he is and how willing he is to listen and, and those things. So, like, kind of being up close and, and personal and getting to hear him talk and getting to, you know, talk with him about, you know, things that I see for him or things that I see when I get back that we'll be able to do. It's just constant conversation. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, we've played two games together. Um, and in both those games, I mean, last night I was on Minister Fiction, the game before is my first game back, like – we haven't got to play together, you know, when we're both in like rhythm and, and, and going. So that's the great part about the year is we got 30 something games left and, um, you know, we just, we're just going to figure it out. And over time, that's the, the great part about adding, adding a guy mid year, especially a guy of, of his caliber that uh, where he's just going to fit in right, right away. Would you say that the acquisition Tyrese Halliburton, our guest, Pascal Siakam, would you say that it creates uh, the most benefit or the most adjustment for you guys on the offensive end or defensive end? Um, good question. You know, I think that probably defensively, I think that he does things that, you know, we just needed more of, you know, he's a long wing that 
uh, can defend, can test shots, and guard multiple positions. I think, listen, at the end of the day, offensively, we're one of the best offenses in the league. Uh, and now we're adding an all-star. You know, we're adding an elite player to our offense. So it just it already flows so well. Like, it's just a matter of him. You know, we've had some practice days now where he can kind of understand, um, you know, the, the, the randomness that we play in. But, and, like, the we like to call it, like, controlled chaos. Like, he understands that. And so I think that the, the more time that goes on with him, the better it'll be and just figuring out our spots and stuff like that. But I think defensively is where he's going to help us uh, the most. Um, and, you know, just offensively, when I'm off the floor, kind of just having another, you know, go-to score guy uh, definitely helps. You know, one thing about you, Tyrese Halliburton, our guest, I think you know this, Tyrese, but let me tell you the narrative when I talk to people like that are around your team and your franchise, not not your teammates, but people that are just around it. Okay, broadcasters, front office people, et cetera. Everybody tells me they're like, the thing about Tyrese Halliburton is he just has this it factor that rubs off on people in a positive way. He's always in a good mood. He always makes people feel comfortable, and it just is infectious in terms of being this overwhelming positive sentiment. Where does that come from? Uh, I think it's just a kudos to the way that I've been brought up and the way that I was raised. Uh, my personality is very similar to my dad's in that I'm just, I just enjoy life. My dad has always uh, just painted the picture to me of, of what life is and the reason that we're here on earth and, um, you know, kind of just have a good understanding of that. So I, I think that's, that's probably the biggest part of it. My dad just always has preached to me that he wants basketball uh, to be fun for me at all times. Like he never wants it to feel like a job for me. And we've had that conversation many and many a times. And that's why I just have fun with what I do just, uh, because of the conversations that I have with my dad and um, who I am and what he's brought me up to do. And so I think that that, that plays, you know, probably the biggest part to it. Tyrese, but I had my buddy Michael, who lives in Melbourne, Australia, just did the West Coast trip with you guys. He literally flew from Australia to go to, to games. And he sends me – he was in De- he was at every game. The whole time that he went to all those games, he sent me three pictures, one with his son with Obi Toppin, one with his son having you sign his jersey, and one with your dad. I think your dad he was the most excited about, actually, of the three photos that he sent me. Yeah, he's, he's become – ever since the in-season tournament, he's become somewhat of a of a local celebrity of some sorts. Hey, will you partake uh, – in terms of the All-Star game, Tyrese Halliburton, our guest, um, I think it's so cool that you're a starter because I think the city kind of sees it as like you're our ambassador, right? Like you're the guy in, in more ways than one. I think you're aware of that. Uh, how much will you partake in the events? I don't know if, like, the three-point shootout has been set – but will you contemplate doing more than just the game itself? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, I'm, I can't say everything that I don't know uh, the for sure is on everything, you know, quite yet. But, um, yeah, I'm going to do everything that I'm asked to do. Um, I choked in the, the finals three-point contest last year, so I'd like to get back there and, uh, and, 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 and have a shot at winning that one. Um, but, yeah, I th- I value – this uh, opportunity is, is definitely something for me that's very, uh, very much so just to be an ambassador of the event. And so that's exciting for me and an ambassador for our city and uh, the organization and, and the fans and everybody. So I, I really look forward to it. Uh, like they always say, basketball is not just basketball in Indy. And I, I think that it's going to give another opportunity for Indy to showcase what it is as a city because I think that people don't think Indy has much to offer, but I understand there's been Super Bowls here, Final Fours here. Like, this is a, a city that can put on large events very easily. Um, and so I'm excited for, you know, the other players and the people who are, you know, coming down for All-Star to, to experience the city a little bit more versus when they come here in January for a game on a Monday and, and it's and it's cold and they don't want to leave the hotel room. Pacers star's Tyrese Halliburton is our guest. Tyrese, when you look at now the addition of Pascal Siakam and, and as you get start to get healthier, when you look at – the Eastern Conference, the NBA as a whole, and the Pacers kind of reminding everybody in that in-season tournament that, hey, we're not just a team on the rise. We're here to compete. We're here to contend. How close is this group to being to that next level where they are in the conversation for competing for Larry O'Brien Trophy? Yeah, you know, I think that we're just a young group kind of figuring stuff out right now. Um, and, and our goal is not only to get to the playoffs, which of course is our goal, but we want to win in the playoffs. Like that's our goal as well. We don't want to like put a, uh, you know, a ceiling on what we can accomplish as a group. I think that we have the utmost confidence that 
no matter who we play on any given night, uh, we have a chance to win the game, a good chance to win the game. We like our chances to win the game. So um, I think for us right now, it's just I think just trying to take it a day at a time and understand how we can get better, like, you know, film sessions, uh, shoot-arounds, practices, uh, all that stuff. I think that that really helps us grow as a team, um, and, and that's how we get better. So I think that that's – the biggest part about it is just how can we get better on a daily basis and be ready to compete with the best. Um, you know, we've shown, we've beaten, um, you know, it feels like every top team in our conference and uh, teams around the league. So we know we can compete with anybody on a daily basis, but it's about creating consistency and, um, you know, just playing Indiana Pacers basketball and creating a brand of basketball that uh, leads to winning. And um, Yeah, I don't have to ask anybody. I know everybody's goal is to win a championship. That's more than anything my goal. So, um, you know, whatever it takes to do that, we're going to do. Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. All right, Tyrese, we're going to ask you a couple non-basketball questions. A little get-to-know, Tyrese. I don't know what there is about you we don't know at this point, but we're going to get to know a little more. Is that cool? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, for starters, some of your outfits, because I know that you're you're a fashion guy, right? You've got a keen fashion that. eye. Now, there have been a couple where I, I've, I've been a little taken aback. Uh, I okay. love the one where you look like – I don't even know if you're aware of this, but everybody thought you looked like a 1930s newspaper boy. Do you know which outfit I'm oh, talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah, 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 I heard it. I okay, heard now, it. Jimmy has a specific question about about one article that you wore on the trip. Go ahead, Jimmy. Where did you get the bright neon green jacket that you wore during the Suns game? Because that thing oh, was it's phenomenal. A, it's, a, uh, it's Bottega Veneta. That's the brand it's called. Uh, but I got it in. And I was like, you know, I got to find a time to wear it. What a better time than Phoenix. Why not? Now, now just, here's the thing. I, it looked like a rain jacket. And I'm like, you're, you're in the desert, <laughs> and it's probably hot there. But then again, maybe it was like drizzly and 50. I don't know. Is it a raincoat? It's like a – it's like uh, – the material is weird. Yeah, it's kind of like a raincoat. Yeah, yeah. Material is weird. It, I, I probably won't wear it again. It's a little loud. <laughs> no, uh, I th actually, but... it was a super cool color because I've never seen a jacket of that color. That's what made it cool, right? Yeah, 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 I thought I thought the material, like my teammates, were like, oh, the material on it is nice. So I, I, I thought it was a hit. I thought it was a good look. I think loud is the right term, though. It yeah. was, it was well, a little loud for now, sure. Now here's what was loud, Tyrese. <laughs> Let's be real here, okay? What's a little loud, and I know. Listen, I, I'm I'm older, okay? Uh, you had a pair of pants on over the weekend that I think it was on Friday night. It might have been the the Phoenix game. Uh, I'll, I'll just say simply wide legged pants. Is that correct? Oh, very wide leg. They were very wide leg. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like at one point, I, I actually said, I go, you know, for example, uh, DeAndre Jordan, who's listed in the program as being 10 pounds heavier than Miles Turner. And I'm like, that dude's like 325, right? And I wondered if just even one of those legs, like, would be around the waist of, of DeAndre Jordan, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. I, you know, I probably could have went with some slimmer pants now I was thinking about it because the jacket was a little loud. So like if the jacket's a little quieter, I go with the baggier pants is like the the loud part of the outfit. But you look like you know Aladdin what? if you really want to know the truth. I mean, no, yeah. no offense, but you look like Aladdin, right? Oh, no offense taken. You know, I think that I thought it was a good fit. Uh, you know, I probably could have went some slimmer pants just because the jacket was pink and loud. But uh, you know, I thought it was I thought it was a good fit. It fit me well. You got anything special planned? You don't have to reveal it, but you have anything special in the bag planned for All Star Weekend? You got to break regard? out the jacket oh. again. Oh, I mean, my fits for All Star have been planned for months, so I'm I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> hey, uh, Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. All right, how about this one? You are, I'm assuming you guys have already made the trip, and you're in New York now, correct? Current, yes, of course. Okay, so in an off day, I, I, I think you guys have already met and had meetings, but it, let's just say that that Coach Carlisle says, okay, you know, we'll we'll reconvene this evening or whatever else. What do you do in your off or free time when you're on the road in one of the great cities in New York City? Uh, well, today um, I had a meeting with Commissioner Silver this morning. Uh, I've never met him before, so it was just kind of an introductory meeting. I, I got drafted during COVID, so it's my first time meeting him. Uh, so that, I did that this morning. I got a team meeting at 1. We're going to watch some film on last night's game and prepare for New York. Uh, and then I got to go to a, a, a watch store. Uh, later, to, I got to get some replacement bands for my for my new watch. And then I go shopping and then probably go to dinner with some, some, some friends who live here and uh, then probably call it a night. I'm a huge watch guy, by the way, so I'm very intrigued there. Real quick, before we let you go, uh, were you nervous to meet Adam Silver? Was it like going to the principal's office? No, nah, no, nah, not at all. He's a great guy. Uh, first time I read him, so it, it was cool. We had a good conversation. Okay, and then lastly, I think you and Jimmy Cook, who you just – the other guy here, I, I think you guys are going to have 
uh, an arm wrestling match here. Jimmy is, um, it's almost scary how much he's a fan of Patrick Mahomes. He's been wearing Chief stuff every day for like three straight weeks. <laughs> how well did you at Iowa State know Brock Purdy? And I've seen that you've worn his jersey. So um, do you talk to him? What is your relationship? And what is your thought on the Super Bowl? Yeah, we text from we text from time to time uh, when either of us are, you know, doing well. We 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 text each other congratulations and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we met my freshman year uh, when we were both just two freshmen on campus, not really expecting to play. And then I think our lives kind of both changed very quickly. He got the starting job by game three. I was starting by game two, and I think it became pretty apparent to Cyclone fans that we were going to be a part of the future of Cyclone sports moving forward. Um, and so I think that we kind of just struck up a relationship from there. Coach Campbell, the football coach, uh, we used to do like biweekly meetings uh, about a book we were both reading on leadership. Um, so we, we, we've texted uh, pretty often. Um, I think both of our lives in college were just so busy. It's not like we spent a ton of time together by any means, but uh, both just always kept in touch. And, you know, we would, the time we spent together would be like on the bus going to class or actually in class. We took like, an accounting class together. We had a stats class together. Uh, so we, you know, sit together in class from time to time. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think there's definitely um, love and, and, and a relationship there. Um, I'm excited for the Super Bowl to see my boy there. Uh, obviously, he was not expected to be here. Uh, so it's cool to see him kind of, you know, beating the odds and, and, and competing the way he is. I'm excited. You know, he's playing against, uh, you know, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. And, and uh, so I'm excited to see him go toe-to-toe with him and, um, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having my Niners gear on. I hope the Ames made right comes up with the sandwich named for Tyrese Halliburton before Brock Purdy. That, that's my goal. Yeah. Although either one would be cool, and I and I'll have either one because made rights are the greatest sandwiches ever made. Um, that's a good point. All right, meeting at one o'clock for Tyrese Halliburton. So he managed to squeeze us in, and it is greatly appreciated. Tyrese, best of luck against the Knicks, and we will see you. It sounds like. Uh, fingers crossed, on the floor for Sacramento back here on Friday night at the Fieldhouse. Enjoy Gotham, all right? Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you. Tyrese Halliburton, the star of the Indiana Pacers, joining us on the program. Rick Fusen, who is the retiring chief operating officer and president of the Indiana Pacers, is going to join us and do so just 10 minutes from now. Are you dealing with foot, knee,
Jimmy is absolutely, I think at this point I can tell Jimmy, like you're you're now conflicted because you made the good point. I mean, Aaron Neesmith yesterday, Miles Turner on Monday, and then Halliburton. I mean, three really good guys, right? And fun conversations. And you find out that he's tight with Brock Purdy, and now you're all of a sudden like, oh, boy. <laughs> you were worried about the Detroit Lions stealing the thunder, and now all of a sudden what are you going to do, right? Look, I can't argue with anything that he said. Yes, Patrick Mahomes, one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever do it, but Brock Purdy's story, his journey, and now being a win away from a Super Bowl, yeah, how, how do you not get behind that? So, no, I don't wouldn't say conflicted. Uh, if anything, I was more aghast that you would try to put me up in an arm wrestling contest with a all-NBA, soon-to-be all-NBA player <laughs> because I would get my stuff wrong. But I, I appreciate you putting me up for that. Couldn't have just done rock, paper, scissors. You had to go straight to arm wrestle? That's right. Uh, speaking of which um... – Rock, paper, scissors. What do you call that, by the way? Just rock, paper, scissors? Just rock, paper, scissors, but I've heard it referred to in other ways. What other terms have you heard for rock, paper, scissors? I saw, by the way, with my own two eyes, I I tweeted this, in the Pacers game against, and I got to think of who it was, Phoenix. I think it was the Phoenix game. Um, Or no, Philly. It was the Philly game. And I can't remember which players it was, and I'm embarrassed to say that now. Or was it? No, it it was Phoenix. Where's Caldwell Pope? Phoenix? Denver. Den- Sorry, Denver. Was it the Denver game? It was yes. Denver. Because- so it's called what up and Jamal Murray. I was thinking it was Booker. That's uh-huh. I always get Burry, uh, Booker and Murray confused. Rochambeau is the other name I've heard. In the Shambos, past. yeah, I was going to say. Um, Rick Carlisle got a technical, and Caldwell Pope and Jamal Murray rock, paper, scissored for who got to shoot the free throws. You, you tweeted that. Yes, I you did. did. That's right. I, I was yeah. like, I've never seen that in the NBA before. <laughs> uh, we called it, when I was in college, we called it Farkle. Okay. Which is kind of dangerous, I guess, on radio. F A R K L E. I don't know if that's a like. I thought Kansas. that was a game already. It, I don't know. Back in 1991, that's what the Phi Delta Theta House at the University of Kansas Alpha Chapter. Yeah, that's called. a dice game. It is. Mm-hmm. That's what we called rock paper scissors. Because I, I remember some guy back in college when there was always like some guy that was just selling random T-shirts on campus of like the Budweiser looking logo with like you know, the Kansas on it and whatever else. Somebody sold T-shirts that said 1991 Farkle Championship, Seattle, Washington, and it had like the little rock, paper, and scissors on it. Any chance it was they actually just it. a fist about to roll some dice and you just <laughs> thought it was? That's possible. Okay, all right. That's possible, right? Which is, that's the way the cavemen played the game. Uh, Rick Fusen is soon to retire, but he's going to chat with us next. The Ride with JMV.
hour underway in Indianapolis. For that matter, it's the 1 o'clock hour everywhere in the Eastern Time Zone. My name is Jake Query, Jimmy Cook, the other voice you hear on this program. And joining us now on the show, it was within the last week or so that Rick Fusen, longtime member of the Indiana Pacers organization, currently the chief operating officer and president of the Indiana Pacers, he joined the franchise 40 years ago, 1984, working in special projects and announced that he is going to be celebrating and heading off into the sunset and retiring and doing so, certainly with a franchise that is in a much bigger and better place than that with which he began, and that's not to besmirch what it was in 1984. But Rick joins us on the program. Rick, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Let's begin with this, and my apologies for asking this question right off the top, and that is, I know that you announced your retirement. I would assume that that simply means at the end of the NBA season, but is there a designated time, per se, when the transfer of power essentially takes place? Yes, actually, uh, I I started on uh, June 18th, uh, 1984, and you don't get the opportunity to be on an even numbers. <laughs> and so I'm going to I'm going to re- sit step down on June 18th of 2024. So uh, it's it's 40 days, 40 years to the day I started. OK, so with that, um, I- I'm going to ask a really dumb question, Rick. OK, Not the- you. no, there's no chance. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's stunning, right? Um, especially especially when you, you you know, you're so good at the Allisonville Elementary School in terms of the. Spelling bee, et cetera. I know you're a Listen, very smart guy. Rick, Rick I, I got totally screwed in that deal. I, I, I had to spell car fare, and then Jody Shear, <laughs> in order to win it, had to spell car hop, and I was the runner-up and not the winner. I, it, it, I'm not yeah. saying that I'm bitter about it, right? But it was I, it was like losing a coin flip for the number one pick in the draft. You know what I mean? It just, you know, that, ha- that happens to a lot of us. <laughs> times, you know? like, the, like the NBA sometimes when they got the crooked corners on the – the, the, the draft thing and whatever else. That's I right. Get it. Totally That's good. right. Uh, Car fair was the Wayman Tisdale. I loved Wayman Tisdale. Don't get me wrong, right? But still, um, I hear there you. were no frozen envelopes at Allisonville, probably. Um, I, I hear you. So, you know, the Pacers back then, when you were, and I would assume, and let's go back to 1984 when you're doing special events. What I recall of those days, you know, were like concerts after the games. I mean, there were ways that you had to entice people to come out, and truthfully, let's be real, the brown curtain days of the Pacers. What did the job entail when you started with the franchise? Well, really, my, my first job, I got hired uh, to work for Bob Salyers, who was the president uh, after the Herb and Mel bought the team. And actually, right then, uh, you know, they were deciding on how they were going to do the All-Star game. And so my job really got to be – uh, about uh, representing the Pacers for the All-Star Game. And there's a woman by the name of Carolyn Blitz, uh, who was the head of the commission for downtown at that point, who really represented the city. So it, when I started, I mean, it was just a few months after I started that we were going to do the All-Star Game. And there was that was just the start of the planning. So at, 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 the, at the time, uh, there were a lot of folks working on those boxing matches and those concerts and, and trying to keep the curtains up and uh, whatever else, uh, and, and I've worked on some of that stuff, but I was more more involved day to day with the All Star Game in, in February. You know, it's funny because that All Star Game, you had All Star Saturday night at Market Square, the great dunk contest between Jordan and Dominique Wilkins, and then the All Star Game in the RCA Dome with or the Hoosier Dome, then with Ralph Sampson the MVP. Now it's the other way around, so you have the All Star Game itself, the prime event being at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. How has I guess the planning and the event itself, how is it going to be different today? Is there anything that's even similar to what you put together in, in 84 for the 85 All-Star game? The thing that's similar is the fact that it's the NBA All-Star game. <laughs> and and that's the only thing. You know, I go back to, to, to 85. There was a decision made uh, one day in Urban Mel's office uh, at Merchant's Tower. And they had a number of community letter, leaders. And they said, well, how, where do you want us to do? The, the, the Hoosier Dome was new. Uh, we had just done 60 or 70,000 people for the Olympic, uh, uh, with the Olympic team, uh, basketball-wise, and uh, they, they made a decision that they were going to do something um, really out of, uh, unbelievably, in terms of, uh, of putting the game uh, in the Hoosier Dome and having 40,000 people there, and at the same time being able to do something that was so fun at Market Square Arena. You know, today, as we looked at it over the last um, seven years, really, since we started planning this, because we were supposed to do it in 21. You know, we've talked to Herb and Steve and, and the commissioner and all the NBA folks about, okay, how can we make this different? It will be different because it's in Indianapolis, because we have such a great downtown, the best downtown. Our hotels are downtown. Um, you, you know, we can, we can make it a campus. 
uh, downtown, and that's going to be significantly different than it was, uh, you know, back in '85 as well. We didn't have that many restaurants, we didn't have uh, that many hotels downtown, and look what's happened, you know, over the years. And at the same time, we wanted to do something really different related to the the competition, and so we convinced really um, everybody that uh, we should have a Saturday night uh, at, at Lucas Oil Stadium, and and it took a while, but. Finally, that was the decision. And then at the same time, in terms of the purity of the game, have the purity of the game at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. So uh, it, was, it was thought about um, in 1984-85 and then again, uh, you know, in the last year or so about this. So we're going we're gonna to make a record. Uh, we made a record in 1985 for the All-Star Game until it was broken in Dallas. And we're going to make a record for the Saturday night having 35,000 people. So it's, it's, uh, this thing is significantly different. Uh, there, we had about one party. Uh, we had one party, one party only uh, in 1985, and now we have hundreds of parties around uh, the city, uh, some sanctioned, some not sanctioned. Uh, but you're going to see uh, this downtown come alive uh, starting when we have this opening ceremony uh, on, on Thursday night, the 15th. Rick, I know it's still a couple months away, but first off, congrats again on the retirement and all that you've accomplished you. in your 40 years with the Pacers. When you look at Back to 1984, the planning of the 85 All-Star Game, to to now and the bookends that those represent, A, have you allowed yourself to you know contemplate what all you've helped be a part of over this tenure? And B, if you haven't, sorry to put you on the spot, but what are you most proud of over this time? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, my dad was a sports writer, and he was with the Indianapolis News for almost 50 years. And actually, I might be most proud about the fact of following my dad downtown uh, we have 75 contiguous years between my dad and myself, over 90 years in terms of downtown uh, between us. And for a family uh, like the Simons or like the Ursays or like the Lilies, whatever else, for a family who has been in sports uh, to be part of Indianapolis and to be part of the growth of Indianapolis, um, it, you know, it's dear to my heart. And um, I, we've done a lot of things, and I've had a lot of opportunities. Um, Herb Simon has given me more than I would ever imagine to me and my family. Go back to Donnie Walsh, who let me work for him for nearly 20 years. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've had such a great career, and, and hopefully I've given back a little bit. But the fact that my family could be part of this downtown in this great city of Indianapolis, in the great state of Indiana, uh, is just as good a thing as I could ever think about. Rick, can you expand upon, you know, I think a lot of people – still think of the Pacers, and not like they did in 1984, but I think people maybe don't realize that there's Pacers basketball and then Pacers sports and entertainment and the all-encompassing envelope that that expands across. Can, can you take me through what the roles are as a chief operating officer of Pacers uh, and president of the Indiana Pacers and Pacers sports and entertainment versus being a guy that's simply selecting rosters? Yeah, cer- certainly. Uh, you know, uh, Kevin Pritchard is our is our president uh, of basketball. Obviously, that's where he, he, his expertise is. I never played in college or never played in the NBA, so I would never get in the middle of that. My 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 job um, is to run the company, and the company includes owning the Indiana Pacers, the Indiana Fever, uh, the, the the Mad Ants of the G League, uh, the the uh, gaming team that we have, and the operation of uh, Market Square Arena. So, uh, so I have a responsibility for, uh, on my side of making the money, uh, finding a way to sell tickets, to have events here, uh, to do the accounting and do the legal work and everything else. So that's the company umbrella. Uh, so I answer to her from that standpoint. But, but the basketball team uh, is run by Kevin, Kevin Pritchard. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it is in most uh, companies in, in uh, sports, actually. Uh, where you have the expert on the on the basketball or the football or the baseball side, and then you have the business guy. And that's what I've been over the years, been the business guy. And we all get along so very well. We always talk about budgets. We talk about things that are going on. Um, you know, I certainly don't ever put myself in a position to say it's a good trade or not good trade, but our guys have done pretty good. So the, the bottom line is we all work together. Uh, but in terms of the bureaucratic stu- structure, uh, I would be in charge of the entire company. Rick, this was supposed to be – the 2021 NBA All-Star event here in Indy. And, of course, with COVID and, and, and everybody's lives were impacted with that. But but on, on your planning side and on the business side, you find out in November of 20 that, hey, we're not at a place where we're going to be able to do this thing the right way. And the NBA reassigns you to 2024. 
Take us back to the initial reaction to that decision and what did that pause and that rescheduling allow you guys to envision and complete? Obviously, the renovations would be first and foremost, but what did that allow you to do with that extra time? Yeah, absolutely. The pandemic, of course, just like you said, was tough for everybody. But in this case, uh, you know, they had kind of an abbreviated all-star in Atlanta that one year. And we said, no, we don't want to do an abbreviated all-star. We want to do it like it should be done. We want the whole thing. We want 1,800 media coming from across the world. We wanted it to be seen in 200 countries in 60 year languages or so. And so we said, help us, uh, you know, go to another year. And so it worked out. They had, they had 22 and 23 settled, and, and so we got 24. And so it, it, there was – and in, interestingly enough, uh, the time frame actually gave us an opportunity to do things that we wouldn't have been ready for in 21. It gave us the opportunity to redo the building, to have this $400 million uh, re, reduc- uh, uh, redo of the building, put a bicentennial plaza there, put the artwork, put the you know, basketball court there, have, have uh, skating, whatever else – and, 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 and give us the opportunity to do things uh, right in Indianapolis so we could show the world that, hey, this, we can handle these things. We handle these things all the time. This is like the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, it's like the NCAA Final Fours. Uh, we wanted to get the entire uh, economic uh, uh, impact of this thing. So, really, it was a talk between Herb uh, and us and the commissioner and his group, and we, we came to an agreement that we'd do 24. And that is a good thing for all of us that are part of it today and hopefully for all the people coming to Indianapolis to be part of it. Now, Rick, when you retire, do you go live on the same farm where you guys sent Bowser like 10 years ago? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, That's very possible. He's he's Uh, living happily on a farm. Kids ask me a lot, and that's where he is, right? He's running and frolicking. Yeah, there's nothing nothing wrong with farming. Uh, it's a good it's a good thing. Right. You know, you're growing you're growing uh, you're growing uh, tomatoes and everything else, and we got to feed the world. So, uh, you know, it's a good thing like that to do. However, however, there may also be a golf course in mind, um, you know, as well. So we'll see. Hey, I want to ask you about this. Rick Fusen is our guest joining us here on the program on Querying Company. Um, the reality is this: I I am naturally. I grew up in Indianapolis, as you know, Rick, and and like you, you know, I I have such this pride about where we are versus where we were. Okay. It's always been a great city, but it's now it's on a different level than it was of yesteryear. And I look around the NBA, which I love, and I look at big markets that, that deserve to have a team, quite frankly. I mean, Seattle would be one. Um, at some point I would think Nashville comes into the conversation. Las Vegas will certainly be in the conversation and I get paranoid and I don't mean this to, to be negative at all, but just knowing the business of professional sports, can you reinforce for me or for our listeners that there is, that, that the Pacers are indeed a continued long-term marriage with the city of Indianapolis that is ironclad? Well, I think that's, I think that's been shown through Herb Simon's commitment to Indianapolis. You know, Herb Simon has said uh, so many times uh, over the last many years, you know, Indianapolis and, and, and Indiana have done for more, more for me and my family than I've ever done for them. Now, you, that, that might be a bone of contention, but a uh, bottom line is that's what he really believes. And, and Herb Simon did a deal to keep the Pacers here for a long term. Uh, Steve Simon is committed to uh, Indianapolis. Uh, Stephen Rails, uh, who now – uh, he owns part of the team, minor part of the team, is committed to Indianapolis. He was a DePaul graduate. Uh, he's got a company in Indianapolis. And, and you know what? I, I have no doubt in my mind, period, end of story, that this team won't be here uh, for the rest of my lifetime for sure. Uh, what can you tell us about Mel Raines, who has been working for your organization and now will overtake the roles that you will be leaving behind in retirement and – um, just your comfort level and being able to hand the keys over there. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% comfortable. She's, um, you know, we, we have had uh, eight or nine years together. I hired her after uh, she came back to Indianapolis. She, I worked with her on the Super Bowl. Uh, we, we, we had a, it was a chance that we took on her, and she has proven herself uh, exponentially in terms of uh, being the right person for this job. Uh, we've got a lot of great people that work for us, uh, but Mel, uh, Mel is a, she's a, a great. Uh, detail person. Uh, she she understands the multiplicity of our business. Uh, she gets along with people well. Uh, she's involved in the community, uh, and that's really what it takes. Uh, 
uh, in terms of, in my opinion, of being part of this great organization and running it on a daily basis, is t- to show your commitment to our city and our state. And Mel has done that. And you know, she's the she. I, I'm the chair, but she's the president of the uh, of the NBA All Star uh, Host Committee. Um, and there's not a thing that she has been asked to do that she won't do. Uh, that's from you know cleaning up after a game uh, to making sure that we understand what's going on in the state house. So uh, she has my hundred percent. Uh, faith uh, and commitment, and I think uh, she will uh, make things even better uh, for our company than I've been able to do over the years, and and we really look forward to her being successful. And by the way, I misspoke, Rick, and I apologize. I do apologize because it is Mel who goes from chief operating officer now to chief executive officer because you in retirement are leaving the position of chief executive officer, so CEO and not COO. This is why I talk on radio and didn't go to Kelly School of Business, right? No, um, but no, I apologize I for that. And neither did I, so I didn't correct you. So there <laughs> we go. Hey, um, when you were last thing here, when you were growing up, you know, you went to Arlington High School. You played football at Indiana. A couple of years difference, I would assume, and I know that you would have professionally known him. But did you run like in in college and high school? Were you buddies with Wayne Radford? Oh, uh, Wayne, absolutely. Um, actually, and his son. Uh, I, I've known as well over the years in, in terms of being friends with uh, the family um, and, and, and one of my nephews. Uh, but Wayne Radford was a, a wonderful man. Um, he gave a great credit to our university and, and, and certainly to Arlington High School. And he was a little younger. Uh, but, man, uh, I'll, I'll never, never, ever uh, forget just how kind a person uh, he was. And we sorely miss him. Rick, finally, when you look back on, and maybe it's impossible to do, but – uh, just if you could, I mean, I, you know, the open forum here for you to just kind of let listeners know what on your way out you're most proud of or most blessed to have experienced, whether it be people, whether it be a certain memory that jumps out. If you were to encapsulate your career with the Pacers in terms of the memories that most are warm to Rick Fusen, it would be what? Well, I've had so many opportunities. You know, you think about going to the finals uh, for your main uh, men's team and winning the finals uh, for the women's team. You know, but at the same time, uh, being able to do uh, opening ceremonies for gymnastics, uh, you you know, when the Kuwait team was there and we got to see them during the war. um, You you know, I mean, there's just so many things to be able to put a to be able to put a a, a pool um, inside Conseco Fieldhouse. Uh, you know, to to be able to have gone to the Beatles in 1964 and then worked all of the shows uh, that uh, that members of the Beatles uh, have been in Indianapolis over the last 40 years. There's too many to just to just just to pick out one. Uh, but the other part of it is that Herb Simon and his family uh, have given me the opportunity to be part of the community. Uh, they they trusted in us. Uh, they trusted us on social issues. And to be able to be somebody who's remembered as a hard worker, uh, who gave to Indianapolis, who who believes in uh, in, in 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 quality and and uh, fairness and equity, uh, and to be able to live that uh, for 40 years in my hometown, uh, that that makes my heart full. And I'm leaving uh, on a daily basis uh, with that in mind uh, that I gave everything I had, uh, and um, I look forward to the next generation carrying on. Well, to keep with the Beatles theme, Rick, many a hard day's night, but you can now play golf eight days a week. So starting in June, enjoy that, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me, and I appreciate the work that you guys are doing for our city and our state as well. Appreciate it very much. Rick Fusen, again, the Pacers CEO and uh, president of the Indiana Pacers, chief executive officer of Pacers Sports and Entertainment, and retiring on June the 18th. Um, Man, I'll tell you what, guys, he's right, Uh, you know, that 85 All-Star game, I, I still remember so vividly, you know, there was just this pride. I, I can't imagine from his standpoint the pride to, to see the transformation of it. But, you know, I, I think that people lose sight of, and I hope people can recognize this, um, you know, I, Indianapolis is such a unique place because unlike a lot of cities, St. Louis, when I lived there, certainly – had this as well but just like you guys I mean the majority of people I think that live in Indianapolis there's more now that would not fit this category but so many people that grew up here still live here you know I mean it's yeah it doesn't have the mountains of 
Denver and it doesn't have the oceans of Los Angeles and the skyline of New York City, but but there's something about what what we have here in Indianapolis is just a, a pride of being from here. And it was hard in the early 80s. There was an element of it was hard to have that pride because it truly was kind of Indiano place. And sports is what this town utilized as his rallying cry to try to establish an identity for itself. And that began with probably the National Sports Festival, as I've talked about many times. You know, in 1980, the Final Four was at Market Square Arena with Iowa, UCLA, Louisville, and Purdue. And, I mean, I would have been a kid, but I certainly remember big events uh, of that time. And, you know, the Final Four being in Indianapolis was not like it is now. The Final Four was just a different animal. I mean, it wasn't anything like it is now. And so we started to get events, don't get me wrong, but that All-Star game and then the Colts moving here and, and everything that was showcased around the Hoosier Dome when it first came here from – the, the Larry's game, you know, the, the, the all-star games with Larry Bird. And then the in 1984, you had the Olympic team under Bob Knight taking on a group of NBA all-stars and then a baseball senior game that had legendary Hall of Fame players playing in it to try to get the Indianapolis Arrows to get an, a major league team here. We, we were grasping at straws in so many areas to prove to people that we were, in fact, a big league town and that we had a chest to push out a little bit and show that we were more than just Louisville or Omaha. And that All-Star game was such a central part of that. And, you know, when Jordan and Wilkins had the incredible historic level dunk contest against one another, I don't know that in the moment we realized what we were witnessing because Jordan wasn't yet necessarily like Michael Jordan, you know. Um, He was huge, but not to the level, obviously. And then Ralph Sampson being, you know, he was the marquee player at that time, having been a three-year star at Virginia and three-time national player of the year. And then he's there with the Rockets and his, his stardom was not as long as other players in the NBA, but he was an epicenter star in 85. So for all of that to happen right here in Indianapolis was, was quite surreal because it was still a time where you would go to, and it's so funny that Eddie played cool in the gang because you would go to a Pacer game and the selling point was not the Pacers, but the opponent. And then the post game concerts, Come down and see Julius Irving, Moses Malone, and Cool in the Gang. And nobody mentioned Jose Slaughter and and Brooks Steppy and Wayman Tisdale and Herb Williams. You know, it was the, it was so to see what has transpired for Rick Fusen to be able to look at that probably and think now about. And I think about it a lot when I go to games, and I'm fortunate to have to go down there and go to the restaurant and see all the events going around it. It is light years from what it was. Light years. Yeah, and I mean, and you look at to go off your point, Jake. That 1985 All Star Game and all that followed with the Colts and everything that really becomes a a spark that sort of lit a fire of what Indiana and Indianapolis was going to become, and for it to be what it is today, we are very lucky that people like Rick Fusion were able to see that vision through and to have it for him. It's so cool to look at. You don't ponder it in the moment, like you mentioned about during the dunk contest. You're not pondering what that moment means. Right. I doubt he pondered what his career would mean, but you look at it being bookended by those two all-stars over 40 it's years. Cool. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah. pretty cool. The way it worked out in terms of, I guess, if there's a positive from the delay of, you know, and, and thank goodness, quite frankly, Quite frankly, thank goodness that they didn't do like a makeshift All Star yeah. game and have Indianapolis be it. You know what I mean? Like with with limited crowd and I mean I'm telling you, like this city, people are going to be stunned coming up here in a couple of weeks yep. in the middle of February. You're going to walk. I remember during the Super Bowl, one of the most surreal moments of my life was going downtown when the Super Bowl was in Indianapolis. Not the, not only the fact that it was 60 degrees in February, but walking downtown. In in the, the the right there and right outside where we are right now, quite frankly, and and looking up and, and seeing the Hampton Inn was turned into a Bud Light hotel, and all the in this car went past, and Adam Sandler's in it, and people are honking, and there's just people you couldn't move, you yeah. couldn't move, right? And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm in Indianapolis. I mean, I've been to Super Bowls in Atlanta, and I've been to Super Bowls in New Orleans, and I'm like, and I'm in Indianapolis. Like, this is crazy, and that's what it's going to be like. I mean, I, I don't know that it's going to be to the level that the Super Bowl was, but it's going to be the closest th- thing we've seen since. 
Like you guys, I'm telling you right now, our parking pass in this building is, is going to be the greatest thing ever because I would strongly encourage you guys and everybody else to just come down and just soak in the ambiance. Oh, yeah. Because it's going to be – I mean, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, and to your point about not rushing it, you don't know how often these come around, especially for the All-Star game. Like you look, it's been 40 years for – any team, not just the Pacers, they have a rotation cycle. And you figure even if they don't do it this way, but even if they were to give every other NBA city an all-star game before you, you're looking at 29 years for the next time this thing's going to come around. Yeah. Enjoy it as much as you can. You, you hope it's not. Correct. But that's probably but, but right, just, right, But just if that yeah, is the way sure. they did it, uh, yeah. Uh, back to talking about what happened last night in Bloomington because there was a lot going on in the world of sports, and I appreciate everybody – Tuning in today for Tyrese Halliburton. That was uh, we're going to replay that coming up about an hour from now. If you did not get a chance to hear the Pacers All Star, great conversation with them from New York, and then Rick Fusen as well. When we come back, something happened last night in Indiana that I think IU fans have been thirsting for, and it wasn't what happened with the final score. We'll explain next. Not everyone can be a. like yesterday taking me back to eighth grade with the tunes i love it i've been putting in all the work in for you jake don't worry what's that i've been putting all the work in for you this week you know this show was like a mockery or that song was like a mockery so is the show but uh that song was like a mockery of bro culture back then well i would like to say this show is not a mockery based off the guest list we've had this week <laughs> yeah we've had eddie man you've been hitting it out of the park lining it up Where right you go, eddie uh anthony leal tomorrow 215 uh sounds like we also have ben shepherd tomorrow as well nice look at you uh, Anthony Leal is exactly what I was just going to talk about. Ben Shepard, by the way, I think going to be a fan favorite here for a long time. So we look forward to that. But Anthony Leal last night. Let's go back to that. Jimmy, you went to Indiana University, correct statement? That is a factual statement. Wait, I thought it was University of Indiana. Whoa. With the sixth pick. 
the Washington Bullets select Calbert Cheney from the University of Indiana. Yes. So, Jimmy, when you were at the University of Indiana, also known as Indiana University, not Indiana of Pennsylvania, the the star basketball player was? Yogi Ferrell. Okay. And people loved Yogi Ferrell, right? One of the fan favorites, one of the great players in IU history. And it is not a requirement that – to be a star at Indiana, that you are from Indiana. We're not that xenophobic. Some of the bigger stars that have ever played for Indiana University. Quinn Buckner. Victor Oladipo. Keith Smart. You know, some of the great names over the course of, of history of IU didn't play high school basketball in Indiana. So we don't require that. Likewise with Purdue. You know, Purdue's had fabulous players over the years that that were not native to northern Indiana. Todd Mitchell. You know, guys that just had, like, that just Jim Rowinski that absolutely just personified the brand of the university. But what Indiana fans, and for that matter, Purdue fans as well, but what Indiana fans like to know is that players that come in there and are playing for Indiana, understand what it means to represent Indiana. And by that, there is, as we know, for Indiana University basketball, the fan base, there's an expectation that this is not a program that just takes in five-star recruits, throws them in a blender and hops it out and does and sees what can happen and isn't overly worried about what happens to them beyond that year because they know they're going to go to the NBA, but let's get what we can out of it while they're here. Indiana fans have always prided themselves on being different than that. But at the same time, it creates in Indiana fans a bit of like a challenge because you know that that is necessary to win games. Like you go back even to Indiana's last national championship team. And that team had Steve Alford from Newcastle and Ricky Callaway from Cincinnati and Daryl Thomas from Chicago. You know, that, that that was your core nucleus, if you will. Midwestern guys that had that, like, Indiana, we, they knew what it took to play for Bob Knight, da-da-da. But what put them over the top is when Knight went out and got Keith Smart from Garden City Junior College in Kansas and Dean Garrett from San Clement, from San Clemente, California, and San Francisco City College, I think it was, for – or San Clement, I I can't remember which junior college, but California nonetheless. But those guys bought into what the the, the Indiana concept of like just the team concept and the ego aside concept, and that's all that people want to know. And now in 2024, knowing and understanding and embracing and accepting the fact that you're going to have players that are of national brand, Indiana's gotten, you know, relied on that to a great extent. And that's cool so long as they kind of do the fundamental things that Indiana basketball fans love. And I think that while Khalil Ware, and yes, I was wrong when I said that Khalil Ware may not play again this year because he was preparing for, you know, wanted to prepare for the draft and not get hurt. Clearly that that turned out to not be what the case was. And he played really well last night and was great for them. And I love Malik Renew. I think he plays hard. I think he does exactly what I'm talking about a kid from Florida that came to Indiana and has really bought in and has been a a very good player for them. And then you have McKenzie and Baco, which, you know what, sometimes you realize why Duke decided to kind of walk from that. And then other times you're like, man, I'll bet Duke wishes they had him. But Indiana last night, Jimmy, when it came down to it, I think there are a lot of Indiana fans that are like, I love that Anthony Leal who averaged 18 and a half points a game in high school and was a Mr. Basketball and a Bloomington grown kid and a kid that dreamed of wearing the candy striped pants and sh- you know set out in his driveway shooting shots in the snow. That's the image we have of Anthony Leal, right? And Anthony Leal represented to a lot of people a little bit of us because we, again, are people that grew up, if you're an Indiana fan, wanting to play for Indiana. And so you're invested in the fact that this guy is fulfilling my dream, not even his dream, my dream, right? And I think there were fans that were like, look, if we're going to go out and lose games where we're shooting 0 for 9 from three-point range, those fans are thinking to themselves. And they say we because it's like, because I'd go out there and hit a three if they let me. 
but what they were pining for is just somebody that goes in and at least represents what it is that they would be, which is somebody that can shoot the basketball. And so last night, Jimmy, it finally happened for him, right? And Khalil Ware was spectacular. And he gets a ton of credit that's getting overshadowed a little bit, perhaps, by Anthony Leal. But the reason for that is because Anthony Leal, who's going to join us tomorrow at 2.15, I think represents the core of what Indiana fans want. And by that, I mean a guy that waits his turn, always is ready. When his number's called, he finally goes in, and he gets his moment to shine, and he's able to do so because unlike anybody else that we've been sitting here banging the drum for all year long, he is able to shoot from the outside. It's a testament to his character as a whole. He highlighted post-game yesterday. This is a quote from him coming out of high school. Everyone has his expectations of playing a lot. I went through a coaching change, highlighting obviously from Archie Miller to Mike Woodson, but he stuck it out because it's a dream come true to be here, whether I play one minute or 40 minutes. And again, just because you're not from here doesn't mean you can't be a good basketball player, doesn't mean you can't succeed at Indiana, but it takes a certain amount of resolve to go through the changes that have been a part of this program in a time when in the sport you have a get-out-of-jail-free card in the transfer portal. And I don't blame players that want to use it. I put larger blame on the NCAA allowing this to become a wild, wild west that it has. And maybe someday that'll get fine tuned. But either way, the point is there is a get out of jail free card there for players. If things aren't going your way, or if you feel like, Hey, I'm a better player than what a program is offering me. I'm going to go somewhere else. And he didn't do that. And he stuck through it. And again, just because you do doesn't make you a lesser player, or a lesser man, but to do that and to be a native while also doing it and not only getting the opportunity, but shining as much as he did, like go look at Anthony Leal's profile page on IU Athletics and go to his stats. His entire career highs in every metric they track was last night against Iowa. Yeah. Well, he surpassed like his, I mean, darn near surpassed his point total, yeah. did he yes. not? Yeah. Came real close, if not over it. And that's just, look, I don't know. This goes back to the moral victory conversation that we had about the Pacers last night. I don't know how far this moment takes Indiana. I don't know how they're impacted by the injuries to Malik Renew and Xavier Johnson and however long those wind up being once we get more information. They're in a tough spot right now based on the schedule in front of them and potentially being hampered further by injuries if that does indeed come to pass. But if they're going to make a legitimate run, which as an IU alum, I hope they do. I want them to do it. I've made it clear. I don't think it's going to happen. But if it is going to happen, it is going to take moments like what Anthony Leal did, like what Khalil Ware has done for a large portion of his time here in this short stint, what he was able to do last night. It's going to he take was great Craig Galloway. Yeah, it's going to take everybody, but it's going to have to be done transitioning from, oh, this is a great moment, to know this is a turning point for the player, for the team, for the university if they're going to save this particular season. I, I've made it pretty clear I'm not fully out on Mike Woodson. I know IU fans hate to hear this because everybody hates to look at, oh, what a great recruiting class because what's a recruiting class really going to matter? Like, I want to see what Liam McNeely looks like in a Hoosier uniform with Mike Woodson. I think that Mbako could likely come back next year. I'm curious to see what 24-25 is, but 23-24 is not done yet even if it is a very small percentage chance. I worry that Ibaka will transfer. Maybe he does. And if he does, that, that we speak to a larger conversation then about what's happening in Indiana because you can't afford to have a player like him. If he goes to the draft, that's one thing. But I think, if he transfers, Jimmy, I will say this. If, if McKenzie and Ibaka transfer, and I mean this is no knock on him at all. Sure. And, and I'm not, I don't think he's a bad guy. So don't, I don't want people to misunderstand me here, okay? But if McKenzie and Ibaka transfers from Indiana, I think in that case – it's as it's because of McKenzie and Baco, not because of Indiana. Okay. So And, and that's and, an important clarifier. Correct. Like I don't think it's because Oh, Mike Woodson was And I don't think he's whatever. unhappy there, don't get me right. wrong. I'm just saying, like it, I could see how he may feel there's a place that's a better fit for him Maybe. than Indiana. Now, um the Khalil Ware thing, uh, you know, Ware I think is undoubtedly going into the draft. He's surprised you, hasn't he? Like you oh. I, I'm not because well, I was the same way, but there were a lot of question marks. Correct. No, with the I transfer, think he's, he's he would clearly be talented, and I'll give him credit. I mean, he, listen, when when Khalil Ware had his injury, the ankle injury that that happened in practice, 
and sat out. You know, Mike Woodson actually said, and I'm paraphrasing to Don Fisher uh, on these airwaves, you know, one of them where he said, well, with Khalil Ware, like if if we can get him to come back, I think is how he, how he worded it. But there were, but I know, like somebody who goes to the practices down there is the one that said to me like, hey, you know, I, I don't think you can rule out, they are not ruling out the possibility that, that Ware may just simply be, like Romeo Langford did. You remember Romeo Langford had the, 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 I think it was a pinky injury? Yep. And once they were eliminated from now, Indiana wasn't in that situation, but but Romeo Langford shut it down. Remember, it was yeah. like he's just not going to play the rest yep. of the year. And I think there was there was thought that that was a possibility. Okay, and so that's what I'd say. But clearly, that was not correct because he went out last night, and probably I'm guessing Khalil Weir figured out like, hey, if I can still play and show that. Because I think from a talent standpoint, he has shown that he is an NBA prospect. When you have a coach like Dana Altman that was public in saying that your motor is not where it needs to be, then you need you probably are aware, hey, we I need to go out and show that the motor now, that's the one question mark about me. I need to show that that is not of question. And knowing Mike Woodson's equal influence, if not more than Dana Altman within the NBA circles, he probably thought, I'm going to go out and show it with Mike Woodson here, and did he ever? I thought he was spectacular. Now, so clearly that information was wrong. Turns out, Eddie, do we have the breaking news sounder by chance? That there was one other prediction I made, and this one, that wasn't a report at all. It was just it was an off-the-cuff prediction when we were talking to, I can't remember who. That is wrong. I was wrong. You know, I should isolate that you admitting you were wrong. It ha- that's the third time it's happened, Eddie. It happened once in 1978 and then once in 1989. Historians are scrambling right now to figure out if there's any correlation between you <laughs> being right. wrong Is and one of those events. the spelling bee? By the, by the no, chance? listen, I got screwed in that deal. Car fare, come on. But you misspelled it, so you're wrong. I, yeah, I, okay. I wasn't, though. Because, for example, if you get like a, a tax on your car, oh, okay, a parking, parking. When you pay a fee to park somewhere, what is that? A parking ticket? I don't know. It's a fare. F A R E. It's a car fare, right? Yeah. There's a difference between being wrong and being robbed, Eddie. Now, in addition to that, True. okay, if you go to a festival where cars are being sold, what is that? Like, if if we have if we have an open forum at the convention center where we are letting people know about available jobs, that is known as a job what? F A I R. What were you wrong about? <laughs> okay. Car fare was the word. Yes. The one that Eddie, that I just discussed with Eddie, is is correct. C A A R F A R E is correct. But right. at the same time, if you have an event where cars are being sold, yep. that would also be a car fare. F A I R. I would agree. Which is what I went with. They said no. It was only Eddie's definition, which I'm like, no, there have to be two of them. And then, and that that's fine. That's fine. But Jody Shear had to spell a word to win it, and she gets car hop. Come on. Glad Rick Fusen remembered that. I mean, come on. Well, I mean, it's only the well first thing well known around Twitter town. bio. That's too right. As well, now, but here's the thing: the, I was wrong when I said uh, Seattle. Maybe there's a bias against the New England Patriots. Maybe those great Bill Belichick New England Patriots teams that were beating everybody, those chickens are coming home to roost, and nobody wants that arrogance. I don't know what it is, but Mike Vrabel, once he was jettisoned in Tennessee, everybody thought he was going to New England. Turns out he wasn't. Bill Belichick already had his replacement in line and now Mike Vrabel not going to Seattle because the breaking news well after the fact of the sounder the Seahawks hiring Baltimore Ravens defensive coordinator Mike McDonald as their head coach wasn't he the lead singer of the Doobie Brothers (laughs) I think it's the same guy with Benjamin Button syndrome that's what happened there (laughs) that's right and he changed careers too he went to coach by the way Benjamin Button that movie let's discuss did you ever see The Curious Life of Benjamin Button? The I've, movie? I've seen the clips. I never watched the whole film. But Eddie, I get the did you gist. watch the movie? No. I get the gist, hence how I can make the joke. It is exactly the same movie as Forrest Gump. To the point where he even like serendipitously ends up on a fishing boat. I'm like, who, like, how did nobody like file a lawsuit over that deal for what it's worth? But anyway, does that surprise you that Seattle goes with that hire? No, I mean, I'm a little surprised that it happened as quick as it did for Mike McDonald because not every coach is going to live this way, but you look at Ben Johnson and him staying 
And there were reports that maybe he asked for a little bit more money than he should have. I don't know the validity of that, but Schefter had mentioned that yesterday. But Mike McDonald had a great thing going defensively in Baltimore. That said, when a head coaching opportunity arrives, you take it. I mean, he's shown that he's a bright, young, defensive mind. It's clearly a young move by the Seahawks. As when you look at McDonald, he's the youngest head coach in the NFL now. At age 36, they had the old head, oldest head coach excuse me, in Pete Carroll prior to that. But more importantly, to your, pardon the pun, to your query about what's going to happen with Mike Vrabel now, head coaching hires. Jim Harbaugh, Antonio Pierce, Ron Mayo, Ryan Callahan, Dave Canellis, Raheem Morris, Mike McDonald. Only seat that's still open is the commanders. Right. And Belichick's still out there. And Vrabel's still out there, even though there's been talks about maybe Belichick and Saban. I've seen rumors about maybe they do a coach cast type thing, like with the Manning cast. Like, that's just been, like, around. I don't know if there's any Could there be too real- many? Here's the thing. And I, I get the fact that in that situation, we probably would find out that they're, like, super funny guys. But, I mean, could there be two more on the surface, more bo- <laughs> You know what I mean? At least Saban has some energy in his interviews. Like, I've seen him in, like, casual sit-down conversations, and he seems like a fun individual, Bill, I can't get over just a monotone. I I get it. I always get a kick out of, and Belichick, I've always heard, is a guy's guy. And I think Bill Belichick is actually kind of the master of taking the heat on himself to take it off of his players. And I I think probably Bill Belichick is a pretty fun dude, to be honest with you. I've always heard that, um, including for people that work with him. Saban may be the same way. I don't know. But I always get a kick out of, and I'm not even speaking specifically to these cases, but it always amuses me, sometimes frustrates me, that the coaches that are the most challenging or difficult to media members are the ones that are the most chomping at the bit to become exactly that as soon as their time is done. Right? Yeah. And I get it. I've said before, if people want to critique what I do for a living and tell me that they could do it better than I and tell me that there are people better than than me doing it, I absolutely have to take those arrows because part of my job is, in fact, to do the exact same thing to people in sports, right? Yeah. So t- fair is fair. With this with, with this hiring cycle, Jake, I, I look at what's around, barring more firings to still happen, I don't think Bill Belichick's going to wind up with a seat somewhere. I would agree. This cycle, because I wouldn't take the Washington job. I don't know... Unless it's a situation where the, the only way that I could see Belichick getting back in, for example, and and I, I'm just going to say this as an example, he could take a page out of Doc Rivers' playbook, go be an advisor right, somewhere a for a year, and then pull off another coup. Like if Andy Reid were to retire, a situation where the the quarterback is yeah. already set at his age or at Nick Saban's age, you're not going full scale. You're not going to go somewhere where you right. got to start all over, like Washington, right? I mean, who's going to be the quarterback at Washington next year? Who knows, right? Yeah. So he's not going to want to go somewhere and, no. and build from the bottom up. You right? need a, you need a place where that key position is already established, where you're not having him do a full rebuild, where at most it's a retool building around an already established quarterback. That's why the Chargers would have made a lot of sense to me. That said, I understand why they went with Harbaugh. I'm very intrigued to see what that looks like, and Justin Herbert finally has a competent head coach to guide him. But, yeah, at this stage, barring a retirement or a – Firing that is not being talked about right now. No way he goes to the Commanders. I think it's 2025 until maybe you see him back as a head coach. At least with the Commanders, you go there and you're like, hey, what's his name's not there anymore now, right? Daniel Snyder? Yeah. Who in the world would have wanted to go work for that D-bag? The biggest ever, right? Uh, Zach Osterman at 2 o'clock. Is that right, Eddie? All right, Zach Osterman talking a little IU that's about 12 minutes away. In order for small businesses to thrive,
it's still fascinating to me when you look at a coaching cycle and at any time, regardless of the sport, when you have big names or at least established coaches. And we talked about Bill Belichick last segment, but in terms of ones that had impacted the Colts and the AFC South previously, in Mike Vrabel, I felt like he would get the same label as other coaches as being a, a gritty, determined coach. It's always going to have you in games. It's always going to have you hanging around a division. And I know it. the wheels kind of fell off the last couple of seasons, but some of that, Jake, lines up with the regression of Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry's inevitable father time battle, and, yeah. and their defense has lost a step. And I know life comes at you fast within the National Football League, but you had made the bold prediction about Vrabel to Seattle. I don't remember hearing his name a ton anywhere. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, honestly, like, I I had read somewhere, to be honest with you, like, that there were people in Seattle that thought he was going to be, he would end up there, and I, you know. But it would have made sense. It Didn't it seem like two years ago he was, like, the hottest coach in, in the league? One of them. Especially I mean, the last five years, like when you go back to them being the one seed and make it to the AFC Championship game, and I know it was kind of the perfect storm. They had a great defense. They could run the ball, and Tannehill was managing games well. But It is weird how – and you know, I don't even know. It, it, it's so – here's the bottom line. You got to have a quarterback. Yeah. I mean, and in Tennessee they may. I, you know, Tannehill was aging, and I think they thought that they – had found the replacement, and then you know, then they're, they're trying Will Levis. I think it's probably going to end up being Levis over Willis, but who knows, right? I, I mean, which is crazy to think that that would even be a conversation, given how much. Even though you could argue it's been in the positions that he put him in, Willis has struggled in the brief moments that he's had to be a quarterback in the league. I mean, they're 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 somewhat of a mess because you don't know, like maybe Willis or maybe uh, Levis is that for them. But if not, or if you're not fully confident in that, or if, you know, from a just organizational standpoint, if Brian Callahan doesn't believe in him, then you're back to square one. And you're back chasing a South that has three quarterbacks. I can't hear, and I don't know why this is. This is a weird Jake Query brain quirk. I can't hear Brian Callahan's name without thinking of Tommy Boy. Now, (laughs) what was the dad's name in Tommy Boy? Wasn't it Callahan Break Parts? That's what I thought, but I don't remember the What was the, the dad's name? name? I don't know. I mean, obviously, Tommy was Tommy Callahan, right? All, all I can do for you on the spot right now is fat guy in a little coat, and that's not going to get us where we need to go, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But I, I think of Bo Callahan for draft day. Nice. <laughs> well, Brian Dennehy played the dad, right? Am I right in that? I believe so. Maybe that's why I'm always thinking Brian, like, it, it, okay, Brian Dennehy is Tom. Tom, so it was Big Tom. But it's the fact that it's Brian Dennehy playing a Callahan. So so whenever I hear that, that's what I go with. Callahan Auto. You were right on that, too. So. Yeah. Okay. I understand. As far as I know, he's not bringing any brake pads. And I've seen the movie pads. like one time, right? He's not bringing brake pads to Tennessee as far as I know. Do you want to know an unpopular opinion? Lay it on me. Talented. And I'm not saying not funny. Oh, no. Chris Farley overrated. Oh, I can't. Again, I think Can't do solid. It. Don't get me wrong, solid. But he, I mean, he had some very funny things. Matt Matt Foley is fabulous, and the, I don't even know the guy, the character's name, but the guy that would do the, you know, I don't uh, wash the area between my <laughs> crotch and thighs. I make babies cry. I, that guy was fabulous. I mean, he had some great stuff for sure. The reason that I can't go there is because, and I think you'd agree with this portion of it. And his one of his closest friends, and he highlights him in every show he does. He did it when he came to town in October. But Adam Sandler highlights how, what a funny guy Farley was, and you know he would have been a part of that whole entourage of the 2000s moving For forward. Sure. And he had so many great bits and sketches and characters in the short time he was in the eye that him you know passing early it's hard for me I not mean, to think man how no, funny would he have been you're in the right second i mean half there's is- no doubt that he was fun i mean don't get me wrong now when when planet hollywood opened here downtown that was actually 
I hate to say it, that was like almost the, be- the the beginning of the downslide because he had had obviously problems, but he was an absolute mess at that. And I, I know for a fact, his brother put him in a limousine and basically said to the limo driver, like, here's, because I know the limo driver, here's a huge tip. Do not take him anywhere other than where he needs to go right now, which was his hotel. And which was not, it was kind of off of downtown. And Farley, he was a mess and and was trying to get him to take him to seedy parts of town and sad. I mean, it's very, very yeah. sad. And he was talented. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Now, I think he was funny, but I, but Will Ferrell, I've always thought, was a no talent. And then don't get me started on Dan Aykroyd. Zach Osterman's <laughs> next. If you're talking about.
You know, when the devil went down to Georgia and laid that golden fiddle in the ground at Johnny's feet, he could have been within shouting distance, perhaps, of the childhood home of our next guest. Native of, I believe they call it the Peach State, Zach Osterman, whose name I got right for the first time in my illustrious broadcast career, joins us on the program to talk about Indiana last night. Zach, how are you? I uh, I once requested that song from a local country station for my fifth birthday. <laughs> now, I, I'm not, that's, a, that's a real story. I'm not joking. Here's the question, though. On said radio station where they played it in your home state of Georgia, did they go with the, I done told you once, you son of a gun, I'm the best it's ever been, or did they yeah, go with the actual I don't think lyrics? We were, I don't think we were ready for the unedited version. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's All right, fair enough. Hey, last night. It was a more um, innocent time. Last night we saw Anthony Leal unedited, finally, and I think you know Indiana fans were happy about that. We'll get to that, Zach, because that was clearly a storyline. But um, I thought Khalil Ware was outstanding for Indiana, but there were some injuries. So let's begin with talking about what you know, if anything, today that we didn't know yesterday in terms of Indiana's health. Yeah, I, I would say I, admittedly not a ton, um, obviously, in the immediate aftermath of some of that stuff, you're not going to have final diagnoses or anything the night of. You're going to maybe need swelling to go down or just need to get in front of a more advanced, you know, scan or something. Um, I guess I would characterize the mood I got before leaving the arena last night as cautious optimism around both players, around basically, you know, the, the possibility that we're not talking about a season ender for either player. But I don't think anybody could go any, you know, a, a heck of a lot further than that. When you see, you know, Xavier Johnson obviously was in a tremendous amount of pain. I have not seen the replay. I've talked to people who have who said it didn't look very good. Um, the Malik Renew thing, I mean, he was in visible distress and was even on crutches, you know, still at halftime. That wasn't just to get him off the, the court um, and get him into the locker room for kind of early treatment. So I don't necessarily, I guess if, if I'm – sitting here and, and trying to find some sort of vague middle ground of it within it all, I'd be a little surprised if either of them play against Penn State, but it does seem like maybe there's some optimism that we're not talking about, you know, either guy just having to shut down for the rest of the year, which given the, the, the immediate severity of those injuries, I, I imagine would have crossed at least some people's minds. Zach, I've already been on the train of I don't think this is a tournament team, but, hey, they're going to have a path. Maybe they could do it. I just I don't see it, and I'm standing by that. But you mentioned the availability for the Penn State game maybe comes into question. When you look at their margin for error of trying to make one last run at this thing over the final month and a half of the season, how detrimental is any absence of Xavier Johnson or Malik Renew to this team's chances? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is probably to some extent, uh, although I would argue to an extent anyway, though, maybe one of the, the positives you saw out of Indiana last night was, you know, this was a team that, that kind of had some big tests in the previous couple of weeks, really shrank from the moment against Purdue. I, I would argue probably did to some extent against Wisconsin, although you really don't, you know, you don't hold it against the team going on the road to the Big Ten leaders and struggling in spurts. Um it felt like they stepped up a little bit more at Illinois, obviously, without Kalel Ware and, and, you know, needing to kind of solve that problem. They were given a lot of a lot of reasons to quit, I guess is my point, um, Tuesday night. A lot of reasons to say, man, this just may not be our night, our month, our year, whatever. And they didn't. And if you are going to have to figure out, you know, a path through life without – you know, and Xavier Johnson, who obviously, you know, unfortunately because of his injuries the last couple of years, Indiana's probably not unfamiliar with, you know, having to figure out how to sort of replace Xavier Johnson in spurts just because he had the broken foot. And then he had kind of the ankle or foot injury from earlier this season. Now this, um, if you're going to have to figure out, you know, sort of a path through life without Malik Renew for any period of time, you know, these things sometimes have a half-life, but it, it – it did feel like you at least saw it got kind of the early response you would have wanted if you were Mike Woodson in terms of a team that really could have kind of gone one or one of two ways given the complexion of that game in the last four or five minutes and then seeing Xavier Johnson go down and, and you know, the, the ability to kind of toughen up individually and pull together collectively I think would be encouraging for Indiana. Zach, when you looked last night, let's talk about Anthony Leal. Um I think that was a win in two ways. 
number one, because of what he was able to do to lift his team. But number two, also, because I think it sent a message to the rest of the roster to just about why he is a fan favorite and about, for lack of a better phrase, professionalism of being ready when you never know when your number, if at all, is going to be called and then contributing. Is that over romanticizing what we saw last night? I don't think so because, I mean, among other things, because it's been noticeable to me that when Mike Woodson has, and you could probably say at times justifiably, um, sort of publicly called out his more experienced players this season. And listen, if a coach is going to call players out, those are the players. That, that, that's just, that is the way this ecosystem works. A coach is, is first going to say, it's on me, it's my responsibility, it's my job to get these guys playing better or to get this fixed or whatever. And then if he feels like he needs to send a message to his roster, he's going to do it first and foremost with his most experienced players, his captains, etc. What has kind of been interesting to me is the two or three times Mike Woodson has felt it necessary to do that this season – He's gone out of his way to say, not Anthony. Anthony Leal is giving me everything I could ask for. You know, you don't see it, and I'm kind of putting words in his mouth in elaborating, but you don't see it, but, but, you know, behind the scenes every day, the way he works, the way he shows up, the way he leads, he's he's not the one that I need more from, essentially. And then when last night happens and somebody asks him about it, Woodson that is, you know, I, I, I thought his, his, quote was apt and was honest he said you know in in the nba we would call that guy a true pro because you know it's it's not the most it it is not the most sort of like rewarding job in the world it can be thankless at times being a guy that's near the end of the bench and and not always getting the minutes that it feels like maybe he earns in practice or you know that, that that he earns maybe with his demeanor or his leadership or whatever but when his number's called he steps in Obviously, he made the shots. The rebounds were important. I thought, you know, I mean, I thought he had, listen, Tony Perkins got the better of him defensively a couple times. I thought he got the better of Tony Perkins defensively in a couple of key spots late in that game, maybe the last two, last three minutes. Um, You know, I think it, I don't think it's overstating it too much the way you put it because it's sort of like Mike Woodson. It's a natural continuation of kind of the way Mike Woodson has characterized Anthony Leal's season so far, even when we haven't seen him on the floor and now if you're Mike Woodson you have the ability to look at the rest of your roster and point at Anthony Leal and say this is what I was talking about this is what I have been trying to get across for all these weeks and months is that you can be the kind of player that does everything statistically well but also the kind of player that does everything intangibly well and if you give me both look what we're capable of as a team. Zach, Leal gets back-to-back season high for him, surpassing one after the other in minutes in the Illinois game and then against Iowa. If it is, let's just say, a one-game example, since it seems like for Penn State that's probably out of the question, but if Xavier Johnson is forced to miss time, who is poised in your mind to benefit more? First go-round when Xavier Johnson was out, you could argue it was Gabe Cups. Is it Cups? Is it Leal? Is it a combination of the two? Where do you expect with that specific position group the minutes get allocated if X has to miss time. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. My suspicion is Cups would probably still start just because he's more of an out-and-out point guard. Um, and we've seen Mike Woodson put more sort of ball-handling trust into Anthony Leo this season and even maybe a little bit going back into last season. But Cups is still just like naturally that's been his position his whole career. That's kind of the, the instincts, the learned behaviors, all that stuff is, is going to be natural to him. The other piece of this, too, is – if you're Mike Woodson and you're without both Xavier Johnson and Malik Renew, and you've got to figure out basically, you know, basically you're going to have to elevate two guys off the bench into your starting lineup. You would presume the other one's Anthony Walker based on some of, of Woodson's past behavior. Well, now suddenly you've taken, you know, two pretty important guys off your bench. And so you're, I guess my point here is if you're Mike Woodson, your consideration may be less about sort of like, Oh, who starts is going to get more minutes and more about, you know, I need to work backward from kind of the end of the game, the last eight minutes of the game, and figure out what, what my rotations need to be to make sure that I'm getting the guys that need the minutes, the minutes they need, but that I'm not overextending my roster and guys are getting played too much. Guys are obviously wearing down as the game wears on, and maybe they're not as impactful late in the game, even to the extent that, you know, the, the thing about if you want to call it an injury crisis, and I don't know if Indiana's in a crisis yet, but you kind of understand what I'm saying, 
is that if you're not careful as a coach, injuries lead to other injuries because, you know, a guy's out and you just say, okay, the next guy has to take all of his minutes plus his minutes and suddenly he's playing too much, his body wears down, he's more susceptible to an injury, then you've got two injured players and the whole thing sort of spirals. So I wouldn't be surprised if Cup starts just because, again, he's a natural point guard, but I think we'd still be talking about a lot of minutes for Anthony Leo. It would just be about Mike Woodson making sure he had a tight hold on obviously what would have to be some some kind of remade rotations without you know two of your top three or four players. Zach Osterman of the Indianapolis Stars, our guest, talking about IU. Zach, in your opinion, when you look at it, have the majority of opportunities for Indiana to punch its dance card to the NCAA tournament already passed them? Or do they still have the majority of opportunities to make emphatic statements still in front of them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's probably more the former than the latter. Um, you know, obviously, you can always get a shock result if, for example, Indiana wins their next two and then goes to Purdue and wins. Well, then, you know, the, the, the conversation changes completely. But if we kind of presume that, you know, the Purdue game is, is – probably out of reach for Indiana. If we presume that Indiana is maybe not in a position where it's going to go, it's going to lose the Purdue game, but win the other nine in its regular season and then go off and do something really crazy in the Big Ten tournament. I mean, I, I, I wrote something today that'll be out tomorrow that kind of gamed out maybe a reasonably optimistic scenario, maybe Indiana finishing the second half of the Big Ten schedule seven and three. That would get them a fair bit of quad two. Um but they would really need some help in the quad one category. They'd probably still only be in maybe a situation where they'd have two or three quad one wins, and you're kind of fighting this uphill battle around this time of year when you don't have those quad ones, especially on the road where, for example, Ohio State looks like a potentially gettable quad one road win, you know, right now today where Ohio State is as a team. But if I'm not mistaken, Ohio State, open today 73rd in the net. So what happens if you play an Ohio State team that's maybe 74th in the net in Columbus, you beat them, but in beating them, you knocked them out of the top 75 in the net. And basically because you beat them, they went from a quad one win to a quad two win or a quad one loss to a quad two win, depending on how you see that Maryland later in the season could wind up kind of falling into the same bucket as well. Um, They've really got to get to a place where they, they, I don't think they can afford to afford to lose more than one more home game. They've got to, make hay where the sun shines. They played well at home, at least in, in spurts. Obviously, the Purdue game was tough, but we saw them play well for stretches last night. We saw them play well for stretches against Minnesota. They're going to have to find a way to do something away from home. And it just, you know, it's kind of one of those where I think it's it's fair to look at any team that is still, you know, kind of needing this much quantity plus quality, if you understand what I'm saying, at this time of year and sort of say, hey, you're going to have to prove it before we can just assume it's possible. Now, you know, these next two games feel big for Indiana. You've got Penn State at home. That doesn't do a lot for you from an NCAA tournament perspective, but you can't afford to lose it. It would also maybe give you a little bit of momentum. And then you go to Ohio State, and, you know, wherever Ohio State is, there's nothing wrong with a road win in the Big Ten. It's never going to hurt you, certainly. Win those two and give yourself – put yourself in a position where it kind of doesn't matter a ton what happens at Purdue – and then maybe you're in a situation where you can attack the, the last, you know, kind of seven games, six, seven games of the season, see if you can't win five of them, maybe make a little noise in the, in the Big Ten tournament, give yourself a chance. It's just between the Big Ten being down and kind of where the opportunities are remaining, it, it's a narrow needle to thread, to be honest. Switching gears real quick, Zach, Indiana, last I heard at least, is in the running for a five-star quarterback for Kurt Signetti. What can you tell us, and how is Indiana in the mix with the likes of Alabama? Yeah, so his, his name is Julian Lewis. Uh, he's from Georgia, so you know he's good. That's right. Um, he uh, He's committed to USC, but he's he just reclassified from 2026 to 2025. So he just reclassified from what we would consider the rising junior class to next fall to the rising senior class to next fall. Um, and he is kind of looking around. I think he's looking at Georgia, Alabama, Auburn, maybe Florida state as well. I think the connection there for Indiana is Tino Sanceri, who's their quarterback's coach and their co-offensive coordinator. And uh, Lewis is expected to visit this weekend is my understanding. Obviously, it, you know, is 
I don't think it, it takes a, a rocket scientist to figure out, you know, USC, Alabama, Georgia, that's, that's going to be tough sledding for Indiana. But I do think what, you know, when you kind of talk about, especially when you consider maybe one of the few questions that it seemed like some Indiana fans had, and I understand where it came from, but one of the few sort of questions Indiana fans had when they brought in Kurt Signetti and then he brought so much of his staff from James Madison was, you know, are we at risk of essentially just having a staff that's not quite ready for the Big Ten? And, and listen, coaching – doesn't necessarily work that way it's not it's not that clean or that binary of like a yes they are or no they aren't kind of situation but what I would say is when you're bringing in coaches who have the credibility already and Dino Sinceri I think is younger than I am which is not something I'm comfortable saying out loud but we are where we are um, coaches who have the credibility to be able to legitimately recruit a player of this caliber that probably answers some of those concerns. And it doesn't necessarily guarantee that your quarterback's play is going to be amazing forever and you're going to win every game and all that. All these things are, you know, tiny bricks in a much larger wall, especially in a sport like football that's got so many layers to it and so many moving pieces. But I think it speaks well of a staff that is, you know, especially on that offensive side of the ball, is largely stepping up from James Madison to Indiana, largely stepping up from – the Sun Belt, obviously, some of those guys have even been with Kurt Signetti going back to, you know, the FCS days, to the Elon days, et cetera, stepping up to the Big Ten, that it doesn't seem like swimming in a deeper end of the pool is, is really ruffling anybody's feathers right now. And so, you know, listen, you, you, you never say never in recruiting. All it takes is, is one kid to look at it and say, I love this. This is a perfect fit. The personality, the campus, everything. But I think it's, you know, in, in terms of maybe the, the more symbolic – importance of it i think a lot of it is maybe answering some of these questions about hey you threw this staff into a more competitive environment can it manage that this is you know one piece of evidence that says yeah it's not gonna be a problem zach will have the coverage for indiana back on the basketball side of things against penn state coming up this weekend zach always a pleasure and appreciate the time today Absolutely. Thanks for having me, as always. Zach Osterman, Indianapolis Star, covering Indiana University Athletics. Earlier in the program, Tyrese Halliburton, who played last night for the Pacers against Boston, gave us a call from his hotel in New York and let us know how that hamstring is feeling and what he anticipates in terms of his return to the court and what he thinks about the rules that say he's got to play X number of games to potentially secure himself a little more money. That conversation next. The holidays might be over.
O'Neill and Paul George as just the fourth Indiana Pacer to start an all-star game, and he will be doing it right here in the city of Indianapolis at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. But before then, on the road in New York, it is Pacers and Knicks next. Last night against the Boston Celtics, Tyrese Halliburton joining us on the show. Tyrese, thanks so much for the time. How are you? I'm good, my man. How are you? Uh, we cannot complain, man. There's a lot to be excited about. And, I, you know, I, I let off by saying – there's no such thing as moral victories in professional sports, but I thought last night there were certainly a lot of things to like. We'll get to that. But I want to begin with the burning question, which is this, and I hope it's only the question that's burning. Um, you know, last night, obviously, you were on a minute limitation because of the hamstring that you're still coming back from. Sometimes I think when you go through something where there's a lot of adrenaline, Tyrese, it takes kind of a day to get a real feel for where things are so how do you physically feel today after playing last night uh, I feel good this morning I feel good this morning I think that was the plan uh hence why there's a minute restriction put in place is that you know you hope that you you know ice get your treatment whatever wake up in the morning and feel good and be ready to go so uh, I feel good this morning um waking up and moving around and be ready to go against the Knicks uh, tomorrow and you know my goal is to play in the back-to-back -back with the Kings the next game and um, I think that if I can show that I can get through three games in four days that that's encouraging to our medical staff and um, you know will help the minutes restriction move along. So you were obviously I, I would assume aware of the minute restriction going into it I mean take me through just that process and kind of who leads that conversation. Yeah, there's definitely a constant conversation between everybody involved in making decisions. Um, you know, for me, it's my it's the front office, it's their coaching staff, it's our medical staff, it's my agents, it's everybody uh, coming together and having you know kind of a group conversation as to what's best for me as a player and uh, you know what's going to keep me on the floor the most. Uh, you know, because that's where I want to be at the end of the day. So it's just constant conversation and. Um, you know, I think after the Portland game, my body not reacting the way I wanted to after the game. I think we obviously had to kind of take a step back and, and understand, figure out what we have to do uh, for me to be good, you know, after um, after games and to be able to, you know, play in multiple games going forward and just be healthy. So obviously you are, I mean, I know it's got to be frustrating at times, right, when the game's on the line and you're sitting there. But, um, you know, take me through that, that dichotomy of emotion because I'm – you clearly I'm assuming that you you know you're aware of it you understand why you're sitting there but man isn't there part of you that's like you know Reggie Miller said on the broadcast look if it's me I'm going in there and I'm saying just give me three more minutes how tempting was it well it was you know I, everybody knows that I'm a competitor like I want to be on the floor um you know but I think that this being my first game back we had a really upfront conversation because the, the medical staff knows who I am and what I stand for and how much I'm playing. So it was the coaching staff. And so it was just a conversation of it literally didn't matter how I performed yesterday. These were my minutes and there was nothing I could do to stop that. Uh, so uh, I just got to the point where there was no need for me to, you know, go to the medical staff and have an argument uh, because I was already, I mean, already angry that I, you know, only played so many minutes anyway. So I'm just trying to do what's right and, and know my big picture and know our team's big picture at the end of the day. I mean, I trust my teammates. Uh, we were still right there to win the game at the end of the day. Um, you know, they made a, a hell of a defensive play there to, you know, kind of clinch the game there. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's frustrating. I'm a competitor at the end of the day. I want to be on the floor. But at the same time, I got to, you know, know the big picture of this and understand I need to be healthy for us to, you know, accomplish everything we want to as a team. Pacers star Tyrese Halliburton is our guest. Tyrese, you're not alone in this, but you, among other players, have expressed your frustration with the 65-game threshold that the NBA has on players that began this season for other awards, All-NBA, MVP, those kind of things that, in your case, directly impact the value of your contract over its life. How mentally taxing is that on you, knowing that it's out of your control with these injuries. This hasn't been a load management thing. You're just trying to go through the rigors of an NBA schedule, and now it's being asked of you of, oh, you can't miss three or four more games, otherwise you're going to get penalized for it. How has that been from the mental side of things through this process? Um, I, I mean, being honest, like obviously it's obviously it's frustrating. Um, I've made my comments known on, on how I feel about it, um, understanding that, this plan. I mean, I, I also understand that this was put in plan, put in play, so that you know guys wouldn't load manage as much. You know, keep guys on the floor, and I fully understand. And I'm a supporter of that. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm 23 years old. If I can play 82 games, 
I, if I could play 48 minutes a game, 82 games a year, I would. Like, I love basketball. I love competing. I want to play as much as I can. Um, but, you know, I can't control being injured and kind of the freak accident that, you know, happened to me this year. Uh, so I really have no control over that. Um you know, so I, I think that it's due to, you know, what our what our league has been in the past and our owners and uh, the league being frustrated by that. And that's completely understandable. Um, but I don't think that this plan was put into play to affect guys that are injured. Um, you see the MVP of our league get hurt last night. And honestly, it's I think that it's crazy that it was very obvious that Joel re-aggravated his knee injury against us. Uh, in Indy, and that has never been – nobody ever spoke on it. No talking heads in the media, nobody ever said anything about it. They watched him limp around for a whole second half, um, and then he misses the Denver game, and now it's a talking point and a surprise that he's not playing, even though it was clear that he had got hurt the game before. Um, and then he re-aggravates it again. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, Joel Embiid paid 60 games this year doing what he's doing, which is one of the greatest offensive seasons we've ever seen – you're voting him MVP. It doesn't matter. So I think that uh, that's the tough part about it. And there's no right or wrong answer. Like that's a problem, you know, but um, at the end of the day, I want to be on the floor. So, I mean, the fact that I have to play to to make all NBA is not a problem for me. I just, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, I'm doing everything I can, you know, keep my body right and be able to play. Um, But yeah, it's definitely frustrating. I think it'd be frustrating for anybody that was put in this position. Um, But I mean, listen, I'm not going to go. I mean, it's hard for me to like, you know, go in the media and complain where I come from. The amount of money that I make currently and the amount of money I make moving forward is life changing money. And, you know, money that I I would have killed for as a a kid. And, you know, my parents killed for for me growing up. So I understand that in the context of it, of course. Um, But that's that money that I could be missing out on. You know, if I don't play those games, um, it's also life-changing money um, on a bigger scale. So, um, yeah, I think there's no right or wrong answer. You just kind of got to go about it the way you can. Tyrese, if there's a media outlet where you just want to, you know, occasionally be able to voice yourself, you're more than welcome any time, right? I mean, we're all for it, right? We don't yeah. want to get anybody in trouble, but let's go, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, um, let me ask you this. If I'm looking at this optimistically, and when you have a player of your, your, your rising star that then – gets hurt and fortunately it wasn't you know a debilitating injury but a nagging one let's say um if there's a silver lining I would look at I would say maybe this gave Tyrese Halliburton an opportunity to see the game with Pascal Siakam now in there and different players to see it while sitting and watching and learning his teammates in from a different vantage point is there any truth to that possibility and is there anything that you saw from somebody where you're like you know, I don't know that I've seen that on the floor. I need to keep that in mind when I'm back out there and meshed in with them. I don't think anybody on our team, I think that going into the season and just as time goes on, like if you're my teammate, I have a very, very good understanding of who you are as a player, what you bring to the table, how I can uh, help, you know, put players and put my teammates in the best position, how they can help me. Uh, so I feel like I have a good understanding on that. I think while I've been out the biggest – thing that I've been paying attention to is just Pascal being around him, how he operates on a daily basis. Um, I think he's a very underrated, I mean, not underrated, but I'm trying to think the right way to say this. Like from afar, you can't tell how good of a communicator he is and how willing he is to listen and, and those things. So like kind of being up close and, and personal and getting to hear him talk and getting to, you know, talk with him about, you know, things that I see for him or things that, I see when I get back that we'll be able to do it's just constant conversation. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, we played two games together. Um, and in both those games, I mean, last night I was on men's restriction, the game before is my first game back. Like we haven't got to play together, you know, when we're both in like rhythm and, and, and going. So that's the great part about the year is we got 30 something games left and, um, you know, we just we're just gonna figure it out, and over time, that's the the great part about adding adding a guy mid year, especially a guy of, of his caliber, that uh, where he's just gonna fit in right right away. Would you say that the acquisition Tyrese Halliburton, our guest, Pascal Siakam, would you say that it creates uh, the most benefit or the most adjustment for you guys on the offensive end or defensive end? Um, good question. I, you know, I think that probably defensively, I think that he does things that you know, we just needed more of, you know, he's a long wing that uh, can defend, can test shots and guard multiple positions. I think, listen, at the end of the day, offensively, we're one of the best offenses in the league. Uh, And now we're adding 
an all-star. You know, we're adding an elite player to our offense. So it just it already flows so well. Like it's just a matter of him. You know, we've had some practice days now where he can kind of understand. Um, you know the 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 randomness that we play in, but and like the we like to call it like controlled chaos. Like he understands that, and so I think that the the more time that goes on with him, the better it'll be, and just figuring out our spots and stuff like that. But I think defensively is where he's going to help us uh, the most. Um, and you know, just offensively, when I'm off the floor, kind of just having another you know go-to scorer guy uh, definitely helps. You know, one thing about you, Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. I think you know this, Tyrese, but. Let me tell you the narrative when I talk to people like that are around your team and your franchise. Not not your teammates, but people that are just around it. Okay, broadcasters, front office people, etc. Everybody tells me they're like the thing about Tyrese Halliburton is he just has this it factor that rubs off on people in a positive way. He's always in a good mood. He always makes people feel comfortable and it just is infectious in terms of being this overwhelming positive sentiment where does that come from uh i think it's just a kudos to the way that i've been brought up and the way that i was raised uh my personality is very similar to my dad's and that i'm just i just enjoy life my dad has always uh just painted the picture to me of of what life is and the reason that we're here on earth and um you know kind of just have a good understanding of that so i, I think that's that's probably the biggest part of it. My dad just always has preached to me that he wants basketball uh, to be fun for me at all times. Like he never wants it to feel like a job for me. And we've had that conversation many and many a times. And that's why I just have fun with what I do just uh, because of the conversations I have with my dad and um, who I am and what he's brought me up to do. And so I think that that, that plays, you know, probably the biggest part to it. Tyrese, but I had my buddy, Michael, who lives in Melbourne, Australia, just did the West coast trip with you guys. He literally flew from Australia to go to, to games. And he sends me. He was in. He was at every game. The whole time that he went to all those games, he sent me three pictures: one with his son with Obi Toppin, one with his son having you sign his jersey, and one with your dad. I think your dad. He was the most excited about actually of the three photos that he sent me. Yeah, he's, he's become ever since the in season tournament, he's become somewhat of a of a local celebrity of some sorts. Hey, will you partake uh, in terms of the All Star Game? Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. Um, I think it's so cool that you're a starter because I think the city kind of sees it as like you're our ambassador, right? Like you're the guy in, in more ways than one. I think you're aware of that. Uh, how much will you partake in the events? I don't know if like the three-point shootout has been set, but will you contemplate doing more than just the game itself? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, um, I can't say everything that I don't know uh, the for sure is on everything, you know, quite – yet but um yeah i'm gonna do everything that i'm asked to do um i choked in the, the finals three-point contest last year so i'd like to get back there and uh and, 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 and have a shot at winning that one um but yeah i thought i value this uh opportunity as, as definitely something for me that's very uh very much so just to be an ambassador of the event and so that's exciting for me and an ambassador for our city and uh, the organization and, and the fans and everybody. So I, I really look forward to it. Um, like we always say, basketball is not just basketball in Indy. And I, I think that it's going to give another opportunity for Indy to showcase what it is as a city because I think that people don't think – Indy has much to offer, but I understand there's been Super Bowls here, Final Fours here. Like this is a, a city that can put on large events very easily, um, and so I'm excited for you know the other players and the people who are you know coming down for All Star to to experience the city a little bit more versus when they come here in January for a game on a Monday and and it's and it's cold and they don't want to leave the hotel room. Pacers stars Tyrese Halliburton is our guest. Tyrese, when you look at now the addition of Pascal Siakam and and as you get start to get healthier. When you look at the Eastern Conference, the NBA as a whole, and the Pacers kind of reminding everybody in that in-season tournament that, hey, we're not just a team on the rise. We're here to compete. We're here to contend. How close is this group to being to that next level where they are in the conversation for competing for Larry O'Brien Trophy? Yeah, you know, I think that we're just a young group kind of figuring stuff out right now. Um, and, and our goal is not only to get to the playoffs, which of course is our goal, but we want to win in the playoffs. Like that's our goal as well. We don't want to like put a, uh, you know, a ceiling on what we can accomplish as a group. I think that we have the utmost confidence that no matter who we play on any given night, uh, we have a chance to win the game, a good chance to win the game. We like our chances to win the game. So, um, I think for us right now, it's just, I think just trying to take it a day at a time 
and understand how we can get better. Like, you know, film sessions, uh, shoot arounds, practices, um, all that stuff. I think that that really helps us grow as a team, um, and, and that's how we get better. So I think that that's the biggest part about it is just how can we get better on a daily basis and be ready to compete with the best. Um, you know, we've shown, we've beaten, um, you know, it feels like every top team in our conference and uh, teams around the league. So we know we can compete with anybody on a daily basis, but it's about creating consistency and, um, you know, just playing Indiana Pacers basketball and creating a brand of basketball that uh, leads to winning. And um, Yeah, I don't have to ask anybody. I know everybody's goal is to win a championship. That's more than anything my goal. So, um, you know, whatever it takes to do that, we're going to do. Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. All right, Tyrese, we're going to ask you a couple non-basketball questions. A little get to know, Tyrese. I don't know what there is about you we don't know at this point, but we're going to get to know a little more. Is that cool? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, for starters, some of your outfits, because I know that you're you're a fashion guy, right? You've got a keen I fashion that. eye. Now, there have been a couple where I, I've, I've been a little taken aback. Uh, okay. I love the one where you look like – I don't even know if you're aware of this, but everybody thought you looked like a 1930s newspaper boy. Do you know which outfit I'm oh, talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it. I okay, heard now, it. Jimmy has a specific question about, about one article that you wore on the trip. Go ahead, Jimmy. Where did you get the bright neon green jacket that you wore during the Suns game? Because that thing oh, was it's phenomenal. A, it's, a, uh, it's Bottega Veneta. That's the brand it's called. Uh, but I got it in. And I was like, you know, I got to find a time to wear it. What a better time than Phoenix. Why not? So now, here's the thing. I, it looked like a rain jacket. And I'm like, you're in the desert, and it's probably hot there. But then again, maybe it was like drizzly and 50. I don't know. Is it a raincoat? It's like a. It's like uh, the material is weird. Yeah, it's kind of like a raincoat. Yeah, yeah. Material is weird. It, I, I probably won't wear it again. It's a little loud. No, uh, I th- actually, but, it was a super cool color because I've never seen a jacket of that color. That's what made it cool, right? Yeah, 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 I thought I thought the material, like my teammates, were like, oh, the material on it is nice. So I, I, I thought it was a hit. I thought it was a good look. I think loud is the right term, though. It yeah. was, it was well, a little loud for now, sure. Now here's what was loud, Tyrese. <laughs> Let's be real here, okay? What's a little loud, and I know. Listen, I, I'm I'm older, okay? Uh, you had a pair of pants on over the weekend that I think it was on Friday night. It might have been the the Phoenix game. Uh, I'll, I'll just say simply wide legged pants. Is that correct? Oh, very wide leg. They were very wide leg, yes. <laughs> like like at one point I, I actually said, I go, you know, for example, uh, DeAndre Jordan, who's listed in the program as being 10 pounds heavier than Miles Turner, and I'm like, that dude's like 325, right? And I wondered if just even one of those legs like would be around the waist <laughs> of, of DeAndre Jordan, right? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. I, you know, I probably could have went with some slimmer pants now I was thinking about it because the jacket was a little loud. So like if the jacket's a little quieter, I go with the baggier pants is like the the loud part of the outfit. But you look like you know Aladdin what? if you really want to know the truth. I mean, no, yeah. no offense, but you look like Aladdin, right? Oh, there's no offense taken. You know, I think that I thought it was a good fit. Uh, you know, I probably could have went some slimmer pants just because the jacket was pink and loud. But uh, you know, I thought it was I thought it was a good fit. It fit me well. You got anything special planned? You don't have to reveal it, but do you have anything special in the bag planned for All Star Weekend? You got to break out the jacket oh. again. Oh, I mean, my fits for All Star have been planned for months, so I'm I'm, I'm prepared. <laughs> hey, uh, Tyrese Halliburton, our guest. All right, how about this one? You are, I'm assuming you guys have already made the trip, and you're in New York now, correct? Current, yes, of course. Okay, so in an off day, I, I, I think you guys have already met and had meetings, but it, let's just say that that Coach Carlisle says, okay, you know, we'll we'll reconvene this evening or whatever else. What do you do in your off or free time when you're on the road in one of the great cities in New York City? Uh, well, today um, I had a meeting with Commissioner Silver this morning. Uh, I've never met him before, so it was just kind of an introductory meeting. I, I got drafted during COVID, so it's my first time meeting him. Uh, so that, that I did that this morning. I got a team meeting at 1. We're going to watch some film on last night's game and prepare for New York. Uh, and then I got to go to a, a, a watch store uh, later, to, I got to get some replacement bands for my for my new watch. And then I go shopping and then probably go to dinner with some, some, some friends who live here and uh, then probably call it a night. I'm a huge watch guy, by the way, so I'm very intrigued there. Real quick, before we let you go, uh, were you nervous to meet Adam Silver? Was it like going to the principal's office? No, nah, no, nah, not at all. He's a great guy. Uh, the first time I read him, so it, it was cool. We had a good conversation. Okay, and then lastly – I think you and Jimmy Cook, who you just – the other guy here, I, I think you guys are going to have 
uh, an arm wrestling match here. Jimmy is, um, it's almost scary how much he's a fan of Patrick Mahomes. He's been wearing Chief stuff every day for like three straight weeks. <laughs> how well did you at Iowa State know Brock Purdy? And I've seen that you've worn his jersey. So um, do you talk to him? What is your relationship? And what is your thought on the Super Bowl? Yeah, we text from we text from time to time uh, when either of us are, you know, doing well. We 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 text each other congratulations and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we met my freshman year uh, when we were both just two freshmen on campus, not really expecting to play. And then I think our lives kind of both changed very quickly. He got the starting job by game three. I was starting by game two. And I think it became pretty apparent to Cyclone fans that we were going to be a part of the future of Cyclone sports moving forward. Um, And so I think that we kind of just struck up a relationship from there. Coach Campbell, the football coach, uh, we used to do like biweekly meetings uh, about a book we were both reading on leadership. Um, So we've texted uh, pretty often. Um, I think both of our lives in college were just – so busy it's not like we spent a ton of time together by any means but uh both just always kept in touch and you know we would the time we spent together would be like on the bus going to class or actually in class we took like an accounting class together we had a stats class together uh so we you know sit together in class from time to time um so yeah yeah i think there's definitely um love and 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 a relationship there um i'm excited for the super bowl to see my boy there uh obviously he was not expected to be here uh so it's cool to see him kind of you know beating the odds and 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 competing the way he is i'm excited you know he's playing against um you know one of the greatest quarterbacks ever and and uh so i'm excited to see him go toe-to-toe with him and um I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm having my Niners gear on. I hope the Ames Made Right comes up with the sandwich named for Tyrese Halliburton before Brock Purdy. That, that's my goal, although <laughs> either one would be cool. And, I, and I'll have either one because Made Rights are the greatest sandwiches ever made. Um, that's a good boy. All right, meeting at 1 o'clock for Tyrese Halliburton. So he managed to squeeze us in, and it is greatly appreciated. Tyrese, best of luck against the Knicks, and we will see you, it sounds like, uh, fingers crossed on the floor for Sacramento back here on Friday night at the field house. Enjoy yes, Gotham. All right. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Tyrese Halliburton from obviously earlier today, that conversation at about 1230. Appreciate the Pacers for helping facilitate that JMV is in the building. We have tickets to give away. Do we not Eddie? We do, but I don't think we have enough time. So let's do it tomorrow. Let's do two trivia questions tomorrow. I was just going to do like caller three. We just do it tomorrow, then? but that's no fun. We have to have that's the trivia. True. We do like the trivia. We uh, gave big a free show one lined up yesterday. for tomorrow. We'll let you know about that, and we'll hand it off to J and V. We'll do it all next. Nobody likes a cold shower. LD Smith has hot deals. On-
the NBA and college basketball. We'll start first with college hoops. Feels like a redemption slash revenge tour all the way around for the Purdue Boilermakers. So we'll lay 13 and a half on Purdue as they host Northwestern at Mackey this evening. John's here. You know what that means. We're scooping points. We're scooping two. The Kings are two point dogs against the Miami Heat in Miami tonight. We'll take the Kings scoop the two. Eddie, anything for you? Negative. No plays for Eddie, so those are your plays of the day. I'm going to scoop two years, Jake, to when uh, the Andretti name can be an F1 again. Can I scoop two years? You know what? Let's make fun of a bunch of Euros today. Can we do that? Have you guys been doing that? I don't have a great deal of stake in this, but it sounds like that Michael Andretti and the Andretti name got absolutely positively screwed by a bunch of money grubbing only if it's American dollars but not American talent in their little racing series. They keep That's doing BS. this too. They keep they do. just So for those that didn't hear it, Michael Andretti got word today, Andretti Global, which is Andretti Autosports new globalized reach and name. They are building a huge facility up in Fishers next to the airport up there for proximity purposes to travel and they have been lobbying hard to try to land an american entry into formula one with cadillac as the engine manufacturer and formula one said john they wouldn't be competitive enough so they yeah. will revisit this and like have you seen we're stopping wins every year anyway why are we worried about being there's competitive? nobody watching f1 point. race there's nothing that's ever competitive about one Nothing. Zero. Very good point. The only reason I'd ever want to go is I'd like to go to Monaco and see if there's topless beaches. That's yeah. about it. Well, Monaco would be pretty cool. Yeah. I don't want to see anything else about it. I want to watch the racing, right? That'd be about <laughs> it. But it always goes on the 500 a weekend, or normally it has. So. Yeah, they they usually have it on. You know, everybody's watching it like uh-huh. the morning of the race, and it's pretty. I good think they know what they're talking sure. about. Oh, look where they go through that tunnel. That wears off like two laps. You <laughs> did go, you go? Oh, they went through that tunnel. Did okay, you go great. to the U.S. Grand Prix? Uh, oh yeah, I did. I went um, the year of the U.S. Grand Prix, the the year of the the whole fiasco where they only had six cars yeah. on the grid, and seated seated in the section where I was were like ten ten guys that were fans of the driver from India that was in Formula One, and that was his only ever top six finish, and they went bonkers every time he went past <laughs> there waving the cut. I mean it was fun, right? Waving the flag and waving the hat, and, and I'm. Because he was going to finish six, I'm like, yeah, there's six cars. I went to some party though afterwards, to where it was down here somewhere, and they had, I think, Travis Pastrana or somebody doing motorcycle tricks in the alley out back. And then uh, it was also interesting to see some of the drivers and some of the IndyCar drivers with their uh, side peas hanging around there. <laughs> that was impressive. Some talent, right? Ruben, I thought Ruben's was going to bring it. Ruben's Barrichello, Ruben's, baby. Ruben's brought the thunder. That's right. Jake, I'm sorry to nerd up the conversation here, but no, you're not the only person. This. Uh, I F1 promise you. European just wait for crap. it. I promise you this is. Uh, you're the only person I could talk to that has pull. Last year at Rocket League, so you could drive around in F1 really? cars. Can we get Indy 500 cars? In Rocket League? Wow, okay. I want you to talk to you to make that, that happen. That would actually but... be smart for yeah. IndyCar, yeah. right? Yeah. They're looking for a video game. That might be the one, right? Yeah. That's actually not nerdy. Why don't That's... they have a video game? But how hard is that? You yeah. get all that technology they partnered today. With Whose the wrong fault group. is that? I Who know. over there do I need to yell at? Uh, the person that, that brokered that deal is no longer there. Oh, well, really? Yeah. Well, well done. How do you <laughs> not have a video game of IndyCar by now? Well, they're back to doing the um, iRacing. Is, you know, for a yeah. while there, they weren't allowed – to do IndyCar stuff, and now that partnership. You got to make it easy, though. I mean, you, to do iRacing or whatever, you got to have all this huge, really nerdy setup. No, you're right. It, and it needs costs to be a lot of money. Yeah. Just the average. We need like pole position, like pole, an Atari twenty six hundred. John, you remember this? The sound of the the great pole position sound, right? Prepare the, to qualify. The, the, the greatest <laughs> sound. <laughs> Go one more time. Prepare to qualify. <laughs> <laughs> That is that is clear as a bell audio, right? When I run around Mount Fuji, I think on mine, right? <laughs> Turbo was the other one of the day back then. Remember Turbo? Oh, yeah. Turbo was another racing game. Uh, what do you got lined up for us, John? We've got Dusty May of Florida Atlantic, nice. friend of the show. We've got Spiro Ditas of CBS and TNT, friend of the show, talks of NBA. I think uh, the wet blanket, Kevin Bowen's going to slide in here at 5 o'clock and give us everything that's going wrong with everything around here in sports and leave us all wanting a little positivity when he's done. And uh, get ready to, uh, tomorrow, back nine. Tomorrow, the back nine, NBA place. Jam. Very the NBA cool Jam, place. Michelob Ultra, high score, wins the shoes tomorrow, back nine. Great vantage points of the city while you're sitting oh, there teeing off. Yes. And it looks like Camden Yards on the outside. Yeah, Beautiful it is an awesome 
awesome look. Now, you know, you get down by the river down there a little bit, and if you turned around and hit the golf ball, <laughs> it'd be interesting to try to find it, but no. Uh, it, tomorrow uh, on the program, we'll have Ben Shepard, Anthony Leal with yep. us, uh, and Shelvin Mack as well, Good for right? Leal, too, by the way, man. That was yeah. great for him last night. He's a good dude. Good stuff, for sure. And John's up next. He'll carry you home here on, a, what is it today, Wednesday? Sounds like it. Thursday, correct, on yeah. a Wednesday. Thanks for listening. We're back at noon. The Wake Up Call with KB and Andy.